wall? <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Is the audio good? Is everything good? Wow. <laughs> hi hi good morning everyone good morning good morning good morning there's actually a lot of faces here i'm a little i'm a little monka s but i think that's just like a normal thing for a streamer right <laughs> well good morning everyone uh as you can tell from the title yes it is the last official week of bearcat school for the summer of course <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I didn't really get to have like a cool summer vacation. So hopefully these next two to three weeks after this next week coming up, I can finally rest and relax. Uh, maybe I could finally stream three days a week. Oh, <laughs> and you know, uh, just kind of keep going. Unfortunately, I'm in Bearcat school until uh, <laughs> uh, 2024 of the spring so i won't be out of here until april may ish so we're gonna have lots more study streams do not worry <laughs> but uh, samir thank you so very much for the follow welcome to the cup club welcome welcome and weber thank you so very much for the tier one sub for four whole hecky months hello everyone ham smash uh, whoa ham smash <laughs> well let me say my hellos to everyone uh just really quick for everyone who's here today again we're going to be going over everything <laughs> um so what i had did basically was i made a google doc of all the other powerpoints and i tried to include like some of the fun slides but this was just me kind of retyping it rewriting it and making sure i surely do understand it and the best way for me to understand it of course or to officialize that a sense of understanding is to teach you cubs so uh uh please bear with me okay we only have like what how many 26 slides 26 slides god i wish uh, 26 pages that's okay we can do it <laughs> starts talking baby <laughs> anyway uh let's let's maybe not do that <laughs> but um mm. Atomic, hello, hello, welcome. Blood, hi, hi, welcome. Tiger, hi, hi, welcome. Hi, Baz, oh yeah? Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> hi, hi. Hi, SG. Stream hype? I, this, the, the hypiest of streams? Uh. <laughs> My, hi, SG, welcome, welcome. Eh? Boss says, Bearcat behind bars, Ruby, please. <laughs> Wait, what bars? <laughs> Wait, I was not aware of this. Unless you're referring to the... <laughs> Unless you're referring to the uh, society that we live in and that I'm forced to be in school to make a really decent living and that I've been doing this for so many years but I won't give it <laughs> I won't give a year because then you'll find out how long I've been forever 17 and then you'll be like oh shoot Tiffany you've been at this for a while and I'm just I'll just be crying and be like yeah I know if you mean those uh, mental bars then y y yeah <laughs> okay um but no hi boss <laughs> Uh, uh, sign in. Hi, hi, welcome. Zero, hi, hi, welcome. <laughs> wow. Mm. Hi, hi, welcome. Marshall, good morning. Welcome, 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 everyone. Like I said, lots of familiar faces. Lots of familiar faces. Uh, 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 I, I would hope my memory's not that bad. And actually, if we do get a moment, we may be able to talk about a little bit of memory today. So please look forward to that, okay? <laughs> hi, sir. Hi, hi. Heck, stream while you're working? Heck. <laughs> Just don't work for head. JK, you also need a living. But no, uh, thank you for stopping by while you're working. I appreciate you. <laughs> uh, just don't get in trouble, okay? Mm. Hi, Yami. Good morning, good morning, good morning. I've come to listen to the pretty bear cat talk about things I don't understand. I got you. By the end of this two hours uh, i hope that there'll be one thing you could tell me and then you'll be like wow i've learned so much and you know it's already a lot to just learn one thing uh, my bearcat school this particular semester in this particular class with neuroscience there's just a lot to comprehend so if you get one thing and you're not necessarily in the program i'm pretty happy <laughs> Ah, hi Sunny, hi hi. Uh, Sunny says hello tips. Let's celebrate since it's your last official week of Bearcat school. Oh, I wish, I wish, I wish. Uh, like I said, I have till 2024, but uh, I, I know I made the title a certain way. <laughs> but yes, last week, summer semester. Let's go, let's go, let's go. <laughs> mm. Bye, hi, Tommy, hi, hi, Dunes. Is that Tiffany? Yes, it is I, the one and only. 
the panya. <laughs> my hi hi, good morning to ya. Huh? Poseidon says my favorite streams the ones where I sit and nod my head pretending to understand everything. Mm, same, 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 same. I do that in class too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, and I'm so sorry, Foss. I'll, I, I will make sure to install the clip system. I don't know. I feel bad because I feel like I need to go clean up my clips before I install the clip system. So, huh? <laughs> but Blood says, uh, what will happen after the official week? Summer? Yeah, yeah. I get to enjoy my summer vacation, but I don't think it's really going to be a summer vacation because... Uh, my birthday again is on the 22nd, my one year anniversary is on the 3rd, and so I'm gonna be working really hard once Bearcat school is over to work on things for the, um, a one year anniversary, and then maybe after the one year anniversary, uh, one year anniversary I can relax, but I'm honestly hoping I get to catch up with a good chunk of anime, like I know I really wanna finish, uh, Attack on Titan Season 3. I want to start watching Maid Dragon, and a new Love Life series came out. Uh, don't get me wrong, I didn't quite catch the last one, but a lot of people are talking about really good things about this one, so I'm looking uh, super forward to it. <laughs> hi hi! Ah! Anubis! Hi hi! Hi sister! Hi hi! Welcome! Finally free? Almost. So almost. <laughs> but yeah, no, I will do my best. Thank you Cubs for your concern. I do appreciate you. <laughs> Wait! I'm like, wait, why are you guys drawing yours out, huh? 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 Ah, uh, Ashley, I'm so sorry. I see that you were going. I hope that you're still here, but please have a good one. Thank you for stopping by, okay? Being in pain since 1998? <laughs> wait. Uh, Cubs, just give me one moment, okay? Uh, not one moment. Well, a really long moment. Look, listen. When I graduate in 2024, uh, <laughs> um, I will help you with all your pain. Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not all, not the emotional pain. Please go see a psychologist. But anything physical pain, I will try my best. <laughs> but uh, just uh, be really patient with me, okay? <laughs> hi, Cohen. Hi, hi. Good morning to ya. Welcome, welcome. Weave, yeah, hello, welcome. Are all just doing an errand for you? Wait, what? <laughs> What? 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 <laughs> I'm so sorry. I feel I feel kind of uh spooky because I'm just like, oh wait, should I make Rip mod? And then I'm like, no, Rip worked hard for her VIP. <laughs> oh, wait. <laughs> hi, Selick. Hi, hi. Good morning. Selick says your clips are too good. No cleaning. Why? <laughs> uh, that's what we call spring cleaning. But you know, it's like in the summer. <laughs> what? Yeah, I really like the false clip. Uh, false would have more clips if he streamed on Sunday like he said he would. This is me naming and shaming. Naming and shaming. <laughs> anyway, anyway. <laughs> May Dragon good? I'm super excited. Imagine keeping up with Love Live. Terry would kick my booty. Terry loves, loves, loves. Loves, loves, love live uh, to the point that she actually recently uh, recently did Johanna art. So uh, please do get to check her out. <laughs> hi, Shiro. Hi, hi. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hmm? You guys are being you guys are being silly. <laughs> anyway, let's get to it. We're already like almost fifteen minutes into the stream, so let me. Uh, breathe. I guess that's um ideal. <laughs> let me su uh, let me sip some water, and life will be good. Hmm? Are all never reminded me to watch the new series? This is a call out post. <laughs> I will make sure to remind him then. <laughs> Just pretend he didn't tell you, <laughs> and I'll be like, "Hey, Roll, you should probably tell Cone uh, that you guys should watch like uh the new Love Life series." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway um let me sip some water because before i start stream officially is the volume okay to the music i've been having such like a difficult time deciding what's loud enough and what's not loud enough so uh yeah okay i'm gonna sip some water Volume's good? Oh, thank god. Because I went to listen uh, back to, uh, what do you call it? 
<laughs> the gorilla stream for the funky night friday and i'm like why did i have it so loud uh... <laughs> anyway uh, i don't want to start studying but i have to mm, evergreen hi hi welcome 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 you made it just in time <laughs> all right let's start the timer Cup. So again, like I said, we're gonna go over the review of everything that we've been kind of doing for um, <laughs> These past study streams. So if anything looks familiar good That means you learned something or like at least had it in the back of your head uh, Like we had mentioned before uh, memory is an, an idea of uh, what do you call it? Uh, you you memorize something by repetition and if it's um Excuse me uh, uh, emotionally uh, affecting you in some way <laughs> sorry you actually don't recall the word for it uh emotionally intensive for you and repetition is uh the best way to remember things <laughs> ah air good morning good morning good morning ah so yeah oh yeah you were dummy loud that stream i'm so sorry that any any volume issues just let me know okay mm -mm -mm -mm. But yeah evergreen you're just in time for the study stream okay I'm so out of breath right now. <laughs> I don't know why. I I sped run some fruit loop eating, so I'm just like, ah. <laughs> anyway, so let's talk about pain. So I know how many times we talked about pain, and I know a lot of you cubs go through a lot of physical and emotional pain. But let's uh, talk about uh, the pain that we can experience in our body or ourselves. So we have somatic pain visceral pain and neuropathic pain these are going to be your major categories and we're going to just talk about their characteristics really quick so for somatic pain just think of anything dealing with the body soma means body so somatic pain is dealing with any of the mechanical chemical or uh, temperature nociceptors recall that nociceptors are just pain receptors into in your body mechanical is kind of dealing with anything with pressure or even like an incision. So imagine you maybe like cut yourself with a piece of paper, or maybe you weren't paying attention while you were cutting onions and you kind of cut your finger. Uh, please pay more attention. <laughs> uh, chemicals kind of dealing with um, when you grab a hot pepper with your dry chapped hands and you're just like, ow, why am I in pain? And it's like, oh, because of the chemical nociceptors in your body. And temperature, we could deal with like hot and cold. You know, if something's too hot or something's too cold, it does kind of send a little bit of pain to us. Normally, when you feel pain within the body, it's relatively localized, meaning that you could normally point out where you hurt. You know, when your um, mama eh, bearcat, <laughs> or when mama bearcat was always like, "Oh no, Tipinya, where do you hurt?" And I'm just like, <laughs> right, right, right here. <laughs> and you know, they like, you know, they give you like a little kiss. They put a bandaid, and the life is good, right? <laughs> Mm, yeah, fruit loop eating. Yeah, I'm a, a <laughs> official speedrun serial either. <laughs> but yeah, air. I'm only a bear cat student of a lot of physical ailments, so I might not be able to help you. But you're more than welcome to ask your question if you're comfortable uh, telling it to the class. <laughs> Psychological pain is the best. Very uh, subjective of you to say, but okay. <laughs> Please pay more attention. I slowly put my phone down. <laughs> no, no, you're fine. Um, how do you say it? Uh, blood. Blood says I wish kissing the pain actually works. Well, you know what actually does work a little bit with pain? When you rub that area. When you rub that area, you're stimulating like the mechanical receptors in your body as well. And that helps kind of alleviate even if it's temporary uh, your pain which is also why parents normally or even yourself when you're hurt you tend to kind of like rub that area to kind of distract your body uh we could talk a little bit about that more later marshall says imagine not having a major fear of accidentally cutting yourself uh well there's a certain way you should hold a knife uh i'm not really a master chef myself but i normally cut with like my knuckles I, I wish I can grab a picture, but um, we, we could talk about that during break. <laughs> but yeah, Eric, go ahead, go ahead. So again, we just talked about somatic, so let's talk about visceral and neuropathic, okay? 
So for visceral pain, this is dealing with anything of your viscera or organs. So the nociceptors or the pain receptors in your body are going to be dealing with any kind of a chemical inflammation that you may be experiencing with your body or uh, anything uh, mechanical, but in the stretching sense only. And I know that's going to sound kind of weird. It's like, huh? my organs stretch and it's like yeah 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 yeah. like again think when you need to pee your bladder will stretch because it's filled with liquid or you know when you eat too much and you're like ah oh, my stomach <laughs> and your stomach stretches this is you know when you eat too much you are technically a little bit in pain because you're just like ah oh. <laughs> and you're feeling that because of that stretchy mechanical nociceptor in your body um, the visceral pain is diffuse, but it can also be referred. So what does this mean? So in comparison to somatic pain where we can point out the pain, visceral pain is kind of, how do you say it? You have a vague idea of where it may be, but it might not necessarily be there. So diffuse, you could say like, oh, kind of in this vague general area as you like, you circle maybe something like your stomach. For referred pain, we kind of talked about that a few study streams ago, but it's the idea of where you feel pain in one part of your body, but the problem is in another. So think about uh, heart attacks. Um, probably not something you really want to think about, but normally when someone is experiencing a heart attack, obviously the problem is their heart, hence the name heart attack. But they may be um, experiencing pain on their upper arm. This is dealing with some of the, uh, eh, I forgot what it was. It's either dermatomes or myotomes. I want to say it's dermatomes. And these are like, uh, how do you say it? Let me see if I could grab a picture really quick. Dermatomes. And uh, for those who are curious about dermatomes, it's basically uh, when you see the picture, your body's going to kind of be divided into these really, uh, I suppose, colorful segments. And these segments are pretty much dealing with that single spinal nerve that comes off from that region. And that's going to give you like that sensation for that specific area. So can we can we grab a good picture? Yeah, this one's good. Let me let me get this one. <laughs> Alright, so you see how your body's kind of divided? Again, it's dealing with the spinal nerves coming out from your spinal cord right here. So C1, C2, C3, and we can see the C2 in the back of the head, C3 back of the head, like the, um, the base of the skull, C4 back of the neck, but you see C3 also comes around. So your heart is dealing with T1 to T5. So when you have referred pain, sometimes someone may experience pain on their arm, like right here in this region. I believe for heart attacks, it's normally the right arm. And so what's going to happen here is, uh, so again, your heart is the problem and you're dealing with the heart attack. You may feel referred pain in this region just because Again, the heart is within that T1 to T5, and T1 stretches right here. So, da da, da da, da da. All right, let's go back. Let me stop the timer really quick. Let me answer your, let me answer your question really quick. But well, hold on one moment. Marshall says, "Isn't putting your finger in your mouth like cutting it after?" like an automatic response not necessarily but for some people i think when they do that they want to kind of apply pressure to stop the bleeding indirectly or they just don't want to bleed all over the place i know how to cut things it doesn't change the fact that the only thing i could focus on is not cutting myself and not cutting the food yeah i honestly think doing the little cat paw method is your best course of action it's very hard to cut your knuckles it's much easier to cut like your finger though. But yeah, I I agree with Evergreen. Evergreen says cutting with a knife just requires you to keep good pacing and uh, spacing of fingers to cut. I recommend a minimal or half inch apart of the fingers from knives if you're um if you're confident with it. All right, and let's see. Air says, so sometimes when I'm lifting stuff at work, I feel like a muscle or something is popping in my forearm. It never hurts, usually just a funny feeling for a second in my forearm. It happens almost exclusively when I'm twisting the arm to throw something onto my shoulder. When I'm twisting the arm to throw something onto my shoulder, okay. So I was curious that the bones in my forearm was just doing something funky. 
and then Selick says, I imagine your tendons uh, slash ligament shifting over your bone in the forearm for that one. I, I probably want to agree that might be the case too. I'm trying to think of what muscle is uh, responsible for that kind of motion. So I'm imagining like you're doing like a Santa Claus, which sounds really, really dumb and you have to excuse me. Like you said that you're putting something like, let's say like a sack over your shoulder, like an object. So when you're doing that motion, you're using like, you're especially using your, um, the flexors of your arms so that's going to be on the front side the front side again is if you are in anatomical position so if you put your palms out forward anything with your palm open and up are going to be all your arm flexor muscles it, when you do that it, how do you say it like those bicep curls obviously you're also using your biceps but you're also using this muscle called the brachioradialis so uh, <laughs> those are the only two muscles I would be concerned with with that but I'm not sure about like this popping feeling in your form huh let me let me let me look into that but I if this is what my instructors say which sounds really bad <laughs> if there's no pain to it don't worry about it like a lot of people worry about their bones popping and my professors say hey it's just air and you know you should only be concerned that if you have popping and then it hurts kind of like uh, most of the time with like yeah, the ligaments or tendons like sometimes <laughs> i don't know if you guys ever had this have you ever like tiptoed so hard i think i did that once and i heard like this pop <laughs> and i was in excruciating pain i was like what the heck <laughs> that, that's when you should be concerned. <laughs> hmm. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm so sorry I wasn't necessarily able to help, but I hope that gave you maybe a better idea. Huh. Hmm? Let me challenge this belief. Wait, Rip, what are you challenging? <laughs> hmm? I wasn't really worried about about it. it just happened a lot and i thought hmm tippa might be interested no 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 and i appreciate it i just wish like i'm still like within my first year so i'm still like a baby i i could tell you muscles and i could tell you maybe what muscles are involved in the action that you're performing and something you should be aware of but i can't necessarily give like solid advice technically i'm not even supposed to give solid advice because um i'm not a professional and even if i was a professional because you're not under my direct care i shouldn't necessarily be giving advice uh. <laughs> hmm. I don't know, Pacone, thank you for stopping by. I appreciate yeah. Uh what what do you what do you call it? Please have a good day at work and thank you for stopping by, okay? Bye 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 bye. Why why were you tiptoeing though? Uh it's in my name. <laughs> I don't know. It's not that I'm short, but sometimes I'm not able to reach things. Uh for reference I'm like five four. <laughs> and sometimes I don't know. I have to tiptoe. <laughs> I thought I was average bearcat height, but apparently for some things I'm just not. <laughs> mm. You can rip, but you're more likely to scrape some of your skin than chop off your entire knuckle. Oh, wait, rip, please don't hurt yourself. No, 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 no. <laughs> um, also, the sack analogy is perfect because it's 90% of time drawing a big roll of insulin on my shoulder. Oh, ah, perfect then. But yeah, honestly... Just make sure not to overwork yourself, okay? Okay. Anyway, let me quickly hydrate and then we'll get back to it, okay? Okay. Man, I already need water. I'm so mad. Mm. <laughs> Alright, let's do this. So... We talked about somatic and visceral, so let's talk about neuropathic pain. Neuropathic pain is not dealing with any of the pain receptors in our body. So it's kind of confusing because we're talking about pain. And so why is there no nociception or nociceptors in neuropathic pain? It's because nociceptors aren't involved in neuropathic pain. How you're experiencing the pain is some kind of pathology with your nervous system. And this could be localized, diffused, or referred. A really common example that we like to use for neuropathic pain is two examples. One of them that you may be familiar with, which is the, um, how do you call it? A phantom limb syndrome, where, um, Let's say you you had to amputee your hand or your foot or your leg or your arm, some body part or some limb, correct? 
well obviously that limb's not there but you still have the sensation of that limb being there and you may be experiencing pain or maybe it's a little bit itchy i like but it's not there again it's just dealing with some kind of it I don't know if the right word is misfiring, but I guess that's like the best kind of visual for that kind of thing. It's like a misfiring of your nervous system. Another fun neuropathic pain that we like to talk about in Bearcat School is uh, allodynia. Allodynia is a very interesting neuropathic pain. It's the idea that something that shouldn't hurt is giving you excruciating pain. So if wind blows onto your face, you are in pain. If you are brushing your hair, obviously, like, of course, if you hit like a tangle and you're just like, ow, <laughs> I do not want to deal with this tangle. Um, let's say you're just brushing your not tangled hair. Uh, that can also cause pain for whatever reason if you had this um, allodynia. So the body is very, very interesting. <laughs> mm -mm -mm. Anyway. So the types of pain that we have and i didn't really get to talk about it but we have an emotional component and we have a logical component to it uh really brief logical is kind of like huh how much and where is this pain and emotional is the one that makes you say ow um those are the components of pain and how you can experience pain is either fast or slow so fast pain has multiple names. It could be fast pain. It could be a spinal thalamic pain. It could be neospinal thalamic pain. It could be neospinal thalamic fast pain. Uh, I really don't know why they named it all these things, but that's okay. So when you're dealing with fast pain, it's how it sounds. It's going to occur at the moment of injury and it's going to be super sharp and stabbing. Highly, highly, highly localized. It's going to be the idea of like, yeah, it hurts right here. But you know, sometimes when you're in pain and the pain kind of subsides a little bit, you're kind of like, uh, yeah, it kind of hurts around this general area. But dealing with fast pain, you could like pinpoint the exact area. It's going to produce an immediate general somatic efferent response. Somatic, again, dealing with body, efferent, dealing with motor. And so this is going to be that withdrawal reflex. So if something is hurting you, you immediately want to take your body away from it. And GFC is a, um, specific neuron type that is uh, dealing with skeletal muscles so it's innervating your skeletal muscles to be like hey get away from here <laughs> so when dealing with fast pain we're gonna be dealing with uh what do you call it a delta fibers which are small myelinated fibers that are really important for fast pain we talked about these like nerve fibers and their speeds we talked about um alpha beta and Wait, no, we talked about A, B, and C fibers. And in that order, it's respectively, it's in respective order from fast to slow. But for the A fibers, you have different fibers. You have like A alpha, A beta, A gamma, and A delta. For fast pain, again, we're dealing with A delta. For slow pain, we're going to be dealing with C fibers. Those are the slowest nerve fibers that we have in our body. Why? Because they're super, super, super small. And they're, uh, excuse me, digesting. <laughs> and they're unmyelinated. We talked about this in the earlier half of the sem uh, summer semester, where um, for nerve fibers, the bigger that they are, the, the faster they are. And the more myelinated they are, the faster they are as well so bigger myelinated is always better for nerve fibers because again that myelination is going to give insulation and that's going to make sure that all that all that uh, information going to those nerve fibers are going to kind of stay in so da -da. anyway for uh new spinal thalamic pathways we don't really need to know too much about it personally for bearcat school but it was still a really good slide for me to put in it's important to know that it's going to decussate or cross over from one side to the body at the ventral white commissioner. And pretty much two things can also be decussated in this area as well. The trigeminal nucleus, which we'll talk about all about the trigeminal in just a little bit. It's one of our cranial nerves that has the three branches and oh goodness, we're going to go into so much detail. And we also have a decussation at the superior colliculi. The superior colliculi is this 
a small part in the back of your brain that's going to be dealing with visual reflex. Why this is important is because normally when you're in pain, you want to look to see where that pain is. So when you do cut yourself, how do, how do you say it? It was an example that my professor had used where he was like, you know, playing with the boys and whatever, and he pushed one of his friends out the window. You know, boys being boys. <laughs> and obviously when you're pushed out the window from the second floor, probably in lots of pain, right? <laughs> well, his friend didn't experience uh, like any pain. I guess it was kind of like the adrenaline and kind of laughing it off and whatever, whatever. But he had like this deep gash somewhere in his arm and because he didn't use his superior colloquy to like look at it, he didn't really quite experience the pain until uh, a passerby. -er? <laughs> Wait, I don't think that's the word. Um, someone passed by, looked at him, and started screaming, <laughs> screaming like in shock, like, "Oh my gosh, this person looks awful!" So as soon as the guy looked at his arm, he realized that he was in pain. That information went to that fast path, uh, fast. <laughs> a uh, pain pathway and he also started to experience pain himself so da da the body's kind of funky oh hi so hi hi welcome welcome ever been burned by unexpected hot water coming from the sink it feels like your body moved first before you even felt the pain <laughs> yeah <laughs> um i recently burned myself in a really dumb way <laughs> I am um, I had got like food out of the oven and I put it on my stove and I'm just like yeah I'll let it cool off but wait let me move this really quick and I had already taken off the mitten so I just like gently pushed it back with like my hand and I'm like ow 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 <laughs> it was the quickest like uh what do you call it we just talked about it the GSE response so that skeletal muscle withdrawal of just me being like nope <laughs> Anyway, anyway, so we talked about fast pain. So slow pain is pretty much the opposite. It's not as quick. This is going to be sent more slowly, but it's going to be super, super, super long lasting. You may also be dealing with aching and throbbing sensation in the body. This is going to be broadly localized. So again, let's say you hurt your knee somehow. Again, you could feel that sharp pain in your knee, but over time that pain is going to localize, meaning that like, oh, before you could point out that it was like the left side right underneath the knee. Now you're just like, yeah, it's just my whole knee hurts. I don't really know where. For, emo um, for slow pain, you're going to create more of an emotional and defensive response. Because if you're kind of constantly in pain because it's longer lasting, you don't want anyone to touch it. You know, uh, I I don't know what's a good injury scenario here, but basically when you're in pain and someone's like, oh, let me look at it or let me feel it, and you're like, no, don't touch me. That's basically the response. <laughs> hi, Blue. Hi, hi. Welcome. So yeah, we're dealing with C neurons. Again, those are small and unmyelinated. And something we didn't get to talk about, I apologize. Fast pain has small receptive fields. So because of these small receptive fields on the body, these are going to be this is why we have that sensation of well localized pain. That's why we can tell where we where that pain is. But for slow pain, they have really large receptive fields. So they're not as localized. Or wait. Yeah, it's not as localized. You're not able to really specifically define that area. When we talked about receptive fields, it's pretty much how it sounds. Receptive of receptive of touch or that sensation. We talked about um, how your body's kind of funky a little bit, like especially with the palm of your hands. So there's a test that we do in Bearcat School using this tool called this discriminator or two point discriminator tool. And it's the idea that you'll have the patient close your eyes and you're gonna poke them with like two, uh, not needles but they're very sharp points they won't cause pain and they won't like create any like lesions to the skin don't worry about that but you have them spaced out and you're like hey do you feel one or two points and then you keep going and going and going and you close in like that that uh, one side to the other it pinches in slowly 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 and there's still two points but there's one point in the patient oh my gosh wait i can't speak <laughs> There's, uh, wait, I got it. 
<laughs> this is gonna be so dummy, so please forgive me. Okay. So, 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 so. You have your patient, right? And their eyes are closed. So when, they, when you give them their hand, or when they give you... That, that's not a hand. <laughs> when you're me, and you're just like, oh, ho holy heck, what, what the heck do I do? You have this really dummy tool. And the tool looks like this. <laughs> uh, <huh. laughs> and what happens is that you can... Um, you can close close it in and you see like i said there's still two points to it but at one point your patient's gonna be like ah that's one point and it's just like mm, no that, that's still two but they have to be like within a normal range there's some measurements yada 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 there's some numbers and then you just see if they're like within normal range of their uh sensation don't know if that helped but drawing a really quick picture did help me out <laughs> Hi potato, hi hi, welcome. And hi Ro, welcome back, welcome back. What's up, Tippy? Nothing much. Just going over the big review. Alright? Ooh. Got five more minutes. Let's do this. Let's do this. So yeah. So we talked about slow pain hat dealing with a more emotional defensive response. And why is this? So we talked about the fact a uh, fast pathway briefly going to the like trigeminal nerve and dealing with this uh how do you say it the visual reflexes well the pain pathway for this is going to shoot more into the limbic system and what is the limbic system the limbic system is a part of your brain dealing with emotions so this is going to project into the reticular formation of the brain stem the amygdala which remember is responsible for those dark side emotions the hypothalamus and the cingulate gyrus so we can see a picture right here so again from that track we can go to these locations right here it'll shoot up through the thalamus because remember our thalamus which is a part of the brain it's going to be our relay station it's going to shoot through the internal capsules and then go to the cingulate gyrus which is going to process that slow pain This is a little funky, so you'll have to like bear with me a little bit. Hmm? Thalamus is the gamer station? Honestly? Oh, whoops, 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 whoops. Hmm. So, this embodied brain from outer space wants you to know, uh, know what each brain region is responsible for in terms of pain processing. So I have a small list right here, and maybe I could point it out on this brain, but I also have this brain. So, let's kind of go with it. So your post-central gyrus, we talked about the brain having the central gyrus, which is this line down here. So your brain is divided kind of in a front and back portion. The front portion of your brain is more dealing with anything motor, and anything in the back is dealing more with sensory. So movement, sensory. So when it is saying the post-central gyrus, it's saying, sorry, let's use this brain here. It's saying the back of the brain, behind that central gyrus, post meaning after. <laughs> and so that's going to be dealing with the somatosensory cortex. So the body sense, somato, somatosensory cortex. It's going to be the reception for the sense of touch. So again, we could feel that pain. Post as in posterior? Yeah, post as in after, post as in posterior, post meaning in the back. Po <laughs> Just know it's behind. <laughs> oh, heck, I keep doing that. Anyway, we have the insula. So the insula is not necessarily visual here, but if you were to uh, politely rip open the temporal lobe and open inside it, there's a specific lobe that's hidden away called the insula. And though that's normally something that we use to, <laughs> uh, uh, the main purpose of the insulin normally is the sense of te uh, sense of uh, gustatory or taste. It's actually a little bit part of the uh, the uh, pain pathway, just a little part. I think it's like one third of it, and that's gonna process and sensation to kind of influence that decision making of when you feel pain like again that fight or flight or being like i gotta get out of here this actually does hurt 
Singular Gyrus again dealing with the limbic system and dealing with emotions and processing that emotion and associating that memory to pain. So again, if you put your hand on the stove, you're like, oh, that was hot. I'll never do that again because that hurt and I was sad about it. That Singular Gyrus switches here <laughs> is going to be that area of your brain responsible for that. Your Dilemmas, we already talked about being that relay station or the gamer station. <laughs> The amygdala, which I don't think we'll see in any of the brain pictures, is again a part of that limbic system and that's going to be the emotional role. It's going to be one of the reasons again why you say ow because this is dealing with how we respond to pain. The superior colliculi is kind of off, like it should be here, but this is still again not like the best picture. And that's going to be dealing with the visual reflex to see where your pain is and the reticular formation which is a section within the brainstem is going to be dealing with any of the pain that you might be feeling in your lower extremities and how that's going to reach up to your brain. So we don't really have to do this quick recap because we pretty much talked about it already. But um, again locations, no! Okay. Uh, wait, 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 let me finish this up because we're almost done. So we talked about already pretty much like the different types of nerve fibers. So the location again for fast pain is going to be dealing with that primary somatosensory cortex in some of the posterior insula. So again, that back of the brain. And then if we rip the temporal lobe open, part of the insula. And so is going to be dealing more with the limbic system. So the singular gyrus, amygdala, hypo excuse me, hypothalamus and brainstem. The experience of pain for fast is going to be sharp and throbbing, while slow is going to be aching and throbbing. And the response to the sensation is that you're going to have an immediate GSC response with fast pain. Again, that withdrawal of like, ow, I do not want to be here, so I am taking my body physically away from this so it can cause no longer, it can no longer cause any more pain. While the slow is going to be more defensive, like, hey, don't touch me because don't, just don't touch people <laughs> anyway so yeah let's kind of go on break and then we could talk about visceral and referred pain just 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 a little bit just, just a little bit okay i actually need to get more water so i might do a quick brb screen okay <laughs> i'm so sorry i'm so sorry but let me read what zoe has to say really quick Zoe says, I wish our body would give pain in a little less painful way, as in, hey, this is a little uncomfortable, maybe stop doing it. Instead, it's, here's some extreme over-the-top feedback about that cut you got. Try not to die, by the way. <laughs> uh, I think that's just basically how we've been raised, you know? Since the beginning of time. <laughs> you know, obviously, if something hurts, you don't want to die. <laughs> so your body's like, hey, please don't die. <laughs> Even the paper cuts like, please don't die. Tend to this right away. <laughs> I wish it wasn't so extreme too, but then, you know, there's different degrees of pain. Uh, like, you know, uh, how do you say it? Pain that doesn't make you feel like you need to die. So, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Zero says request. Could you not rip my, rip my lobes open? Uh, no. And I deserve a break? You're absolutely right. I'll be right back. I really do need to grab some more water and inhale as much air as I can. Because <gasps> <laughs> I feel like I'm blah, 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 blah. But I also feel kind of like nasally, so I don't know. Maybe I'm getting sick cubs. Please help. Milk <laughs> it out, my system. Hmm? Zero says the only pain that makes me feel like I need to die is missing a tippy stream. Ruby, please wait, Zero. That's actually the sweetest thing you've said. Wait, you don't have to. Oh. <laughs> I'm going through a mix of emotions, as you can tell. <laughs> anyway, some people were born with less painful pain, sadly. Now, they aren't as successful surviving uh, to reproducing age. So here we are. <laughs> no. This is, I can, I can get behind that. Anyway, what else I can get behind? A break. Hey, <laughs> quick BRB, quick BRB. Ba -ba 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 -ba, gotta get water. Ah, actually leaving my desk and leaving my room. Ah, <laughs> hold
<laughs> I hi. Oh no, Rip, you have to go. Please have a good one, okay? Ah, uh, thank you for stopping by. I appreciate you very, very much. But what the S tier music? <laughs> ah, Blue Grey, thank you so very much for the follow. Welcome to the Cup Club. Welcome, welcome. I was really worried about the five minute break. I was just like, will I have enough time to make tea? <laughs> so, I'm gonna sip some really hot tea. Accidentally burned myself, but I guess purposely burned myself. <laughs> <laughs> and then let's continue on. <laughs> hi, hi, blue. Hi, hi. Oh, sorry, green. Hi, hi. Sorry, because I know we have a uh, cornflower here. Heck. <laughs> Heck. <laughs> anyway, hi, CJ. Hi, hi. Welcome. Ah, medical science stream. The thing that will continue to go over my head. Mm, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> and Aral, if you want, I feel so bad. <laughs> I am <would> change. <laughs> I feel so bad. <laughs> I can edit it if necessary, but I guess there is a reference of BTTV emotes that we had in the um, the about panels, but still. <laughs> if you have time, I appreciate you, but don't trouble yourself, especially because it's not as easy to do it through like chat. Voila. <laughs> okay. Let's purposely drink some tea. Yep, just a little hot, but that's okay. Like your hair? Thank you, thank you, thank you. My hair is styled by the beautiful, wonderful <laughs> uh, Teru Pancake, so please do give her your support. She's the one who made my hair so beautiful. <laughs> hmm. No, no, you're you're okay. If you're cursed with big dumb, I'm cursed with even bigger dumb. <laughs> Not a competition, but yeah. <laughs> Supreme cult leader, yeah, but sheep cult leader because, um, you know, you know if you know. <laughs> anyway, let's start back up, okay? And thank you, Roy, appreciate you! <laughs> oh, heck. Okay. Timer here? Alright. So we talked about the different kinds of pains. Now let's talk about uh, the visceral and referred pain into more detail. Again, visceral dealing with anything with the organs, referred pain dealing with pain in one area when it's really another. So what happens is that we have these uh, membranes in our in our organs, correct? We have the parietal, which is going to be the most outer layer, and then we have the visceral, which is really kind of directly over the organ itself. What's going to happen is that the parietal, or the most outer layer of the, um, what do you call it, body cavity, is going to be loaded with GSA pain receptors, general somatic afferent. Soma again meaning body, afferent dealing with anything sensory. This is going to be dealing with pain receptors of touch, pain, and temperature. For the visceral one, again, directly right over our organs, that's going to be our innermost layer, and those are going to have GVA, general, visceral, aether, again, sensory uh, rece uh, pain receptors, and the visceral body cavity is going to be dealing with, again, GVA, which is dealing with hunger, blood pressure, distension, which is kind of the bloating or swelling, similar to what we were talking about with the stomach, or any kind of visceral inflammation. Hi, Peaky. Hi, hi. Welcome, welcome. And Aral says, oh no, I took a screenshot of the old BTTV message. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, you're perfectly fine. Here, give a give a good old tip of Doru in chat. <laughs> That's one of my prouder accomplishments in December. <laughs> anyway, anyway. Um. Yeah. Really, um, just being able to understand that in my Bearcat school that hey, Parietos GSA and Mr.'s GVA. Uh, really good difference again is the name itself. Parieto again is de dealing more with the body, and the visceral is dealing, well, of course, more with the viscera. Da da da! Easy peasy lemon squeezy. Um, we could talk about pain modulation. Modulation could be to increase the pain or to decrease the pain. And antineoception, which again is just anti-pain receptor. 
So we're gonna have local, spinal, and supraspinal descending pain modulation. For local, we could kind of just deal with uh, dealing with the inflammatory sites in our body so normally when we feel inflammation normally it's something wrong or pain Bearcat school is having a whole debate like inflammation isn't inherently a bad thing similar to pain yeah inflammation sucks but it's also your body fighting off i don't know i don't want to go into that whole spiel but for a uh, local pain modulation we could actually just kind of take medication to kind of turn down or inhibit these uh inflammatory sites so you know you can use over-the-counter medication such as like ibuprofen or aspirin for spinal pain modulation we could talk about physical stimulation so again we are talking about it uh, like when you hurt yourself maybe at the park when you're young and your parent uh what do you call it kind of like rubbed your arm it's like oh it's gonna be okay it's gonna be okay that mechanical or that touch and pressure that they are providing to you that mechanical stimulation on the infected site can inhibit the pain from going up more into that brain pathway to make that pain worse <laughs> it's really really interesting we also talked about tendons briefly which is that a um Sending those like, eh, eh, how do you? Oh my gosh, how how do you say it? <laughs> ah, that's gonna sound scary if I say it the way I want to say it, which is just sending like electric electricity through your body. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, we put a certain intensity of electricity to your body to help kind of distract you from the pain. It's not supposed to be painful, but there is an acute and chronic setting. So chronic, I think it's more kind of stimulating and make your muscles contract, while the acute is more like a pins and needles sensation, maybe almost like a, even like a little massage for the TENS unit. Um, anyone can pretty much grab their hands on a TENS unit, but again, I just don't recommend it if you don't know what you're doing necessarily. <laughs> Please talk to your physician. <laughs> um, yeah, and another pain modulation, we can talk about the supraspinal or descending, and this is kind of dealing with that fight or flight or top-down modulation, which may suppress or amplify pain signals, but eh, really, honestly, we're looking for is suppressing the pain. So we talked about a fight or flight in a sense of, hey, you're being chased by an angry bear cat, but you have a broken ankle. Wonder who did that one. <laughs> but you know, you obviously can't run if you have a broken ankle, but you also want to save your life. So you're going to ignore the pain or suppress the pain signal that's coming from your broken ankle to make sure that you run. Da -da -da. Gets cut, pulls out a taser, finally. No, 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 no. Here, 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 here. Wait, 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 wait. Can we, can we find tens unit? Hold on. We don't have to, we don't actually have to see this. Yeah, it's just, yeah, that buzzing sensation. So she has like a tiny one right here. She puts a little electro pads in an area that she feels like she's experiencing pain. It looks like she's doing IFC, uh, which means that she's using all four pads because I see one right here. She's going to turn up the intensity. You don't really see too much because she's more feeling the sensation, but you see how many cables she has? These are long booty cables. <laughs> hi, Dr. Joe. Hi, hi, Dr. Joe. Look at her. She's living the life. Anyways, hey, let me. I need to study. Anyway, uh, yeah, yeah. So that's like a tense unit or like a, a tense unit you could get maybe at like over the counter or like CVS or like Walgreens or any kind of like pharmacy. Yeah, they might not work well if you uh, place them not bleh, if you don't place them in the right area. Like you wouldn't place it directly over bone. You just place it in that kind of affected area. Yeah, um, tends won't solve your problem. It's just an idea of dealing with pain modulation of kind of decreasing that pain sensation. Again, uh, the best way to put it is that it's gonna distract you from your pain, but it won't say it won't help. Bye, Kev. Hi, hi. Welcome, welcome. Yeah, you really can't hurt yourself because even if it's painful, it's not really that painful. It might just be like, oh, that's a little too strong. And then you can just easily turn it down. You are the, uh, what's you call it? <laughs> uh, you are the person in control of this, so it doesn't have to hurt. 
Mm -hmm. So when somebody's entire body is hurting, they should just get struck by lightning? I think they'll die. <laughs> more, more times than none, I think they'll die. So I don't recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really good for acute pain. Can also be good for chronic pain. It just kind of depends on the person. We could talk about this more. Two semesters in <laughs> again. <laughs> what about head on? Should I apply that directly to the forehead? Potato says you're a gamer in control of your brain. Exactly, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Uh, boss says, wait, attack on titan? Lightning when they get injured? I thought it was lightning because they turn into a titan. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. We're getting to my almost favorite part about the cranial nerves, but let's kind of finish it up with neuropathic pain. So again, neuropathic pain is dealing with not nociceptors, but dealing with some kind of strange pathology that you're having in your nervous system. This can kind of be signed up. Signed up summed up defined hello words as a dorsal horn reorganization after injury which can promote pain signals and create like this extra sensitization of the injured or severed nociceptor fibers so again there could be no current injury but you may experience horrible pain at a certain location without anything actually being wrong with it we could also talk about neuromas, which are kind of like pinched nerves, which bring pains and burning sensations, tingling numbness to a certain area because of these severed nerves. And one neuropathic pain that they wanted us to focus on specifically is the Lamech syndrome or central post stroke pain. Oh, <laughs> look at me on my table. Um, this is going to be dealing with damage to the thalamus, which again, thalamus are relay station. Uh, so damage to thalamus causes pain fibers between thalamus and cortex to fire improperly and these cannot be regulated with opiates. Opiates again, or uh, what do you call it, would activate the sending pain modulation neurons. So opiates are like the natural opioids, it's the slight issue we had with the opioid addiction I don't know how many years ago and well, technically even now I guess. You know, people don't want to feel pain. And for this kind of uh, Pacific Syndrome, you, your normal pain relief chemical cannot work for this because your relay station is firing improperly to the cortex, so you're just kind of always in pain. Kind, kind, kind of sucks. Kind of sucks is basically what I'm trying to say. Just don't, don't damage your brain in any shape, way, or form. It's a summary of what I can tell you for this Bearcat School class, okay? <laughs> Anyway, pain on nerves! Huh? Earl says, so what you're saying is that if I bend to my wrist hand and get struck by lightning at the same time, there's a small chance that I'd become a titan? Uh, I wouldn't recommend it. Would not recommend trying to experiment that. <laughs> anyway. So unfortunately, when you look at a real brain, the cranial nerves aren't, aren't so beautiful. And aren't so colorful but they're super 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 amazing what they do so we're gonna kind of talk about it in extensive detail okay so uh please bear with me okay so we have 12 cranial nerves all kind of coming from all these wacky places olfactory and optic nerve are going to be coming from your cerebrum everything else is going to be kind of coming off from the pond or the mandula oblongata or some kind of junction like kind of the in-between like the abducens you see here you know i love me some bear puns aha <laughs> sorry <laughs> anyway um so let's talk about them okay we're gonna go the good thing about the cranial nerves is that they're named in the order that they appear so we're gonna kind of go in order from what you see from here all the way down here so fun sorry i keep scrolling away from this so a fun way to memorize all the cranial nerves is kind of to use mnemonics i think that's the best course of action a popular mnemonic that's safe for work uh that we like to use in bearcat school is oh 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 to touch and feel wait sorry oh 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 to touch and feel very green veggies ah uh, Wait, I, I did not do that right order-wise, but that's a mnemonic. To determine if these cranial nerves are motor, sensory, or both, we like to say this mnemonic. Some say money matters, but my brother says big brains matter most. 
And so I have them kind of color coded. So green for sensory, M for motor, B for both. Did I just tell you to touch grass? No. <laughs> no, I did not. <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah, let's go off with the first cranial nerve, shall we? So the first cranial nerve is the olfactory nerve. So the olfactory nerve is responsible for your sense of smell. So in current world events right now, you see that a lot of people may have lost their sense of smell. Very unfortunate, but this is this means that there's some kind of dysfunction into this olfactory nerve. This nerve again is going to come from the cerebrum, so again right up here. And it's going to be exiting off the skull into the cribriform plate. Or sorry, the nerve- wow, hold on. The foramen or the hole or the opening of the skull that they use to kind of like escape from or exit from is going to be the cribriform plate. So some clinical scenarios dealing with the olfactory nerve is that, hey, if you lose your sense of smell, the technical term is going to be as anosmia, which means loss of smell. One way, uh, one way we can, <laughs> uh, <laughs> one way we can uh, test this <laughs> is we are we have our patient close their eyes, right? And they use their smell. <laughs> they use their smell. <laughs> they use their nose, right? <laughs> and so you ask them, "Hey, can you like cover one side of your nose?" Okay. Well, um, I'm going to put this nice smelling orange near you, but I won't tell you what it is. It's gonna use that as an example. I'm like, "Hello, ma'am and or sir, can you smell this?" And they'll be like, no. And I'll be like, okay, you have something wrong with you. Okay, can you cover the other side of your nostril for me? Heck. <laughs> can you cover the other side? And they're like, yeah, I can do that for you. And I'm like, oh, but can you smell here? And they'll be like, no. And I'll be like, okay, girl factory nervous like shot. <laughs> but yeah, that's a way to t uh, t <laughs> That's one way to definitely um, test the uh, sensation of smell in someone. I lost smell sometimes due to COVID. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that means that your olfactory nerve got affected. So I'm sorry. You want to try smelling salts? I have no experience with that. So I, I wish you the best of luck. <laughs> uh, how do you say it though? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. So anyway, olfactory nerve, right? Olfactory nerve is dealing with vision. This is gonna emerge from the cerebrum as well. So again, olfactory and optic nerve emerge from the same place. But the foramen used to exit the skull is going to be the optic canal. Some clinical scenarios for optic nerve, if you if you were to ever have a lesion, is blindness, bitemporal hemianopia, and homo hem hem homo hom homogeneous homogeneous no hom hom. <laughs> I sound. <laughs> I, I asked my classmates, but they always tell me the wrong one. <laughs> Homonymous. Hononym. Hon. Ho. Ho. Homonymous. 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 Ah, uh, So let's kind of break it down. So let me open paint back up. So, your eyes are kind of funky, right? Your eyes are- oh my god, your eyes are like super funky. So, let's see. This is your- this is your eye. These are your hemispheres of the brain. They can- Hold on. So you got this, you got this, you got this, and then you have this. <laughs> this is not an accurate drawing of your eye by whatever means. But what happens is that it's so weird. So whatever you process on the left side of your eye actually goes to the right side of your brain. So let's see, left, right. I think we talked about this before. 
sorry no i just have to like draw the whole thing which is kind of wacky but it's okay <laughs> just you have to bear with me with these drawings <laughs> anyway so yeah Anything that you see on your left side of your brain is going to go on the right hemisphere and anything from the left side is going to Left side right hemisphere right side left hemisphere. Yeah, 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 yeah So what's gonna happen is that if you were to have blindness You would have blindness because we're cutting into your optic nerve right here So what happens is the reason why you have blindness is because you severed connection of both the left and right from the hemisphere and that's why blind I, how do you draw a blind person wait is that insensitive anyway here there you go it's not insensitive if you draw the person with like the the walking stick right <laughs> so that's why someone would have a uh, blindness it's because you cut both the left and right um connections and you were you severed one of the uh both optic nerves from this eye so they don't have connection that's why they can't see cancel tip why <laughs> hi lem jams hi hi hello, hello, hello. <laughs> um if you were to cut right here you'd be cutting at the optic chiasm when you cut at the optic chiasm this is what's gonna happen so you see how the left side can no longer go to the right side so you lose this here you lose the left side and then you see how the right can no longer go to the left hemisphere that means that you lose the right side so how someone is going to see is like this so we'll put their eyes right here put their eyes right here and let's kind of mirror this so let's see if they're not able to see from their left side they're not able to see here if they're not able to see from their right side they're not able to see from here these are like completely like shot as well and so they only have what i guess the best way we can put it is tunnel vision i'm just gonna type that one out because tun <laughs> why do i have to be a memer with comic sans all the time hold on tunnel vision brown <laughs> now 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 if you were to have a lesion yeah uh, Lem Jams, so think about, uh, are you familiar with like the horse in New York? <laughs> yeah. Or like horses in general where they have like the blinders so they only see right in front of them? That is the same kind of mechanic when you have a lesion in your optic chiasm. It's the idea that you can only see straight ahead and you have no peripheral uh, vision. Sorry, I'm like version. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so very much for the follow. Welcome to the Cup Club. Welcome, welcome. I promise I do more than studying, but hey. <laughs> you kids and your memes. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ha, ha. If my doctor handed me a paper of comic stands, I'd be... T <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why? <laughs> oh, no. Anyway, so if you were to have a lesion here... So if this is your optic nerve, this is your optic chiasm, if you have a lesion here in your optic tract, what's going to happen is that you cut vision from both right sides. Because remember, what you're processing through your eyes on the right side, anything right is going to go to the contralateral or opposite side. So all the right uh, five nerves are gonna go to the left hemisphere but if you cut connection to the left hemisphere this is how your patient is going to present so we cut the right side so they no longer have vision on the uh, same side <laughs> sorry and that's gonna be the homo 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 no 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 miss and then this is gonna be the bi-temporal one and you know oh well that's readable <laughs> anyway that 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 is all the funky things you have to know about the optic nerve so quick review again if you were to cut into the optic nerve you would have blindness in this eye completely if you were to cut at the chiasm, you would cut one of the left and one of the right, and so you would end up with tunnel vision, so you would only be able to see in front of you. 
oh no and then we have um which is basically same side well, actually here's a better way to remember it so you know when someone is having a <gasps> ryan ahaha <laughs> sorry this is not saying ahaha ryan hi 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 Welcome! What's going on here? We're studying. This is what they call Bearcat School. You're lying. You wouldn't know. No, I'm just kidding. I feel bad. Wait, is that discrimination? <gasps> sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Cancel that. No! No! <laughs> anyway. Um, it's a joke. Yeah, I'm just seeing a study stream. I mean, normally I actually have notes, but we're just going over like the optic track really quick. <laughs> Lem says, I've learned more from school from just, I learned more from uh, school from just the three minutes or so I've been here. Oh no, I meant to say I've learned more from here than school. Your poo poo brain. <laughs> no, you're perfectly fine. I appreciate you, Lem. Thank you so very much. I feel always so bad before like I've learned more here and I'm just like, wait, no. <laughs> but I'm just happy that you're learning. I, I, I love to teach when I am mentally prepared to teach. <laughs> I cry, but only small tears, only the smallest of tears. <laughs> Welcome, welcome. It's nice to see you. It's been a while. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, if you cut here at the optic uh, nerve, you get blindness. Check. If you cut here at the chiasm, you have bitemporal vision. So again, like when you have headaches and you rub like your temples or the sides of your like, this, like you know, you have your forehead and then you have like the side of your forehead, which is your temples. Bitemporal meaning that you lose vision on that at the temporal area. So off to your sides, and that's why again. That tunnel vision where you can only see like in front of you. Check. <laughs> and then is when you lose the same side. Because remember, homo means same. So if you lose both right, then that means it's the same. So uh yep, that's 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 it. <laughs> uh, uh. It's entertaining and not boring. Thank you, I appreciate you. Ah, break time. Okay, get it, get it, get it. Uh, hi, blood. Hi, hi. Hi, Berkey. Hi, hi. How does color blindness work? I got you. Yeah, homo means same. Hetero means different. Uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, is it controversial if I say homosexual? <laughs> oh, 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 yeah, homo means same. So like when people refer to like homosexual, that mean like the same like gen same sex? Yes. And then hetero means uh, different. So like when someone has um different eye color? Wait, what do they call different eye color? <laughs> hetero something, right? Wait, that D different eye color. Hetero heterochromia. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Same. I'm saying same. Same. M. Uh, wait. <laughs> same. <laughs> Just write in in caps really quick. <laughs> I was very excited, as you can tell. <laughs> uh, I thought everyone only sees in front of them. No, but you have peripheral vision. Okay. Ah. Uh, ah. Uh, here, and we're gonna we're gonna do this. Ah, uh, perception eye test? A vision. There's a sprung. Or a vision in one eye. Vision. Limiting depth. I cannot, I cannot find this. Heck. Used to have hypochrom. Hi. Below? Oh! Oh, oh, oh. No, you're fine, boss. No problem, no problem. Lem, same to you as well. I'm like, hypo. Hypo mini below? Hypochondriac. Hypochondriac. Heck. Mm. But wait, 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 wait. Blood, Blood Knight says, how does color blindness work? I got you, I got you, I got you. So how color blindness works, and we can like literally like zoom through this really quick. <laughs> I'm not gonna get through this, as you can tell. But don't just don't look, just don't look, just yeah. 
So what happens is that you have photoreceptors in your eyes. So you have rods and cones. What's gonna happen is that rods are, uh, what do you call it? Very numerous. Uh, they're sensitive to light. They're most active at low light. So like if you, you're taking out the trash, but you see a raccoon, but you're not sure if that's a raccoon, a rabbit, or a hecking baby, uh, you're still able to distinguish it, but it's just really gray and fuzzy. It's just shades of gray. But cones, on the other hand, and this is where we're going to talk about the colorblindness, they're less numerous and they deal with the, uh, what do you call it, your perception of color. So you have a red cone, a green cone, and a blue cone. So people who experience colorblindness are born without one of these cones, and that's why they're able to see some colors, but they're not really able to see some others. Because the red, green, and blue is just like those mixtures and all that other stuff. But yeah, I, I hope that like really brief thing helped out. Maybe let's we'll just go back to the brain. <laughs> mm. uh, but no, no. Hi, anime. Hi, hi. Welcome. You read Mitochondria? Mm. <laughs> we'll say hi, hi. Welcome, welcome. Whoa, we're studying biology again today? Yeah. <laughs> we're doing a little bit of... Wait, we do a little bit of neuroscience in here. <laughs> Just buy more cones. Uh, excuse me. I I have a very frugal lifestyle. Can't just buy more cones. <laughs> the only cone I know is cone hand. Wait, wait. What about the whole cone family? You just can't forget them, or all. You just can't forget them. <laughs> I love these study streams just to crack jokes about random stuff, <laughs> and I appreciate it. Lem says, "What causes you to lose some vision when you have a really bad migraine?" Uh, I'm not actually entirely sure. I'm so sorry. Blood says, so cones is visualizing and cones is colorizing? Yeah, uh, that's actually a really good way to put it. Both of them are both photoreceptors, so they're both going to be dealing with visual. But more specifically, cones, or sorry, rods are going to be... More for night vision i guess when they're when you're dealing with low light situations and your cones are going to be really active when you have lots of light so you can be easy so you can, blah, 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 blah. you can easily identify the colors and such <laughs> the only cones i buy are ice cream cones <laughs> no the five minutes went up so fast <laughs> yeah like gaming in a dark room so obviously when you're in the dark and the low light, you know you probably have all this colorful animal- Animal? Hello? Anime figures on your desk and such, but you're not really able to distinguish the color. You might be out of just sheer memory of like, yeah, I know my waifu's skirt is red. <laughs> but when you're in low light, you might not be able to identify that color so easily. But you could tell that the figure is there, you know? <laughs> um... Yeah, 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 yeah. So I hope that helped. <laughs> Boyardee? What? Oh, and Atomic, welcome back, welcome back. <laughs> I need a waifu figure? Me too. Me too. <laughs> Stares at Hanio. <laughs> Hi, Laura. Good morning, good morning. I just joined and I see Brain Woman with Brain Picture talking about waifu figure skirts. Uh, these are what they call the biggest brain conversations. <laughs> anyway, please let us continue on because it's already 1230. I'm gonna I'm gonna cry. Where are we? Okay, so we talked about vision. So let's actually talk about uh, how do you say it? Eye movement. Eye movement is super super interesting. So eye movement is actually innervated by three different muscles. Oh three different muscles, I apologize. Six well uh, let's not get into that. Three different cranial nerves, ocular motor, trochlear, and abducens. These all are gonna do different things, but these are all gonna innervate your extrinsic eye muscles. Extrinsic eye muscles again are gonna be the muscles responsible for movement. And if I wanna say correctly on the top of my head, we have six. We have six extrinsic eye muscles. So ocular motor for eye movement specifically is going to innervate four out of your four out of the six extrinsic eye muscles so let's actually kind of go more in depth right here yeah so the function is that it's going to be four out of six eye muscles and the levator uh palpebrae superioris superioris excuse me and that muscle that i just said the levator one is going to be dealing with keeping your eyelids taut what that means is that 
your eyelids aren't drooping over when you have your eyes open right now <laughs> and that's all thanks to your ocular motor nerve uh working its way out because if you were to have a lesion of some sort for your ocular motor god you would have a lot of issues because it deals with so many muscles but how do you say it <laughs> you're this this would probably be your eye right now hold on let me quickly draw it Bam. Yeah, so this 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 would be you right now. <laughs> Obvi you see your eyelid is t let me use a different color before I cry. Top? Which is like that tightness of keeping it up. But if you were to have a, a cranial nerve three or the ocular motor lesion, your eyelid you wouldn't have the innervation and keep your eyelid like this, so your eyelid would droop. Lazy eye? Yeah, actually, I think that that is the word. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think you, if you, I don't think it's because of the droopy eyelid. I think, but I do think ocular motor still does play a role in lazy eye. Because lazy eye, like to my definition, is like, like that, you know? Ta da the wrinkles are forming as we speak. Yeah, honestly. <laughs> But yeah, yeah, we're just talking about cranial nerves right now, but now we're just talking about eye movements, and this is your lazy eye. Okay, <laughs> anyway. I put this away. So yeah, it also deals with the- oh no, <laughs> we'll talk about that later. But it also deals with parasympathetics parasymp to the iris and the ciliary muscles. Uh, I guess we could talk about it now, but we'll talk about it more in depth in a little bit. So parasympathetic we talked about sympathetic and parasympathetic correct sympathetic is dealing with your fight or flight and your parasympathetic is your rest and digest think of para even though i know it's not supposed to be like this think of para like a parachute hey you're skydiving oh my gosh i'm gonna go on a tangent i'm so sorry um you're skydiving your fight or flight kicks in because you're like oh shoot i'm falling where's my parachute ah so as, you, as, as soon as you get your parachute going, you can rest and relax now because you know you are safe. <laughs> is, is that a good way to memorize it? Uh, either way, so when you know that you're safe, you're going to constrict your pupils. And so what does this mean? Back to the eye drawing. So what this means is that when you are in a panic normally or when you're activating your sympathetic, your, your, your pupils are so big. So, you know, normally they're like this. But we're gonna make them super big because we want to grab as much as we can with our eyes so we can be safe because we're we're like we're like panicking but the ocular motor again is dealing with parasympathetic so your your eyes are just you know normal <laughs> That's what that means. And the lens accommodation, we're talking about kind of like nearsighted and farsighted stuff, which again, we'll talk about in a little bit. So the part of the brain that they emerge from, the ocular motor, it's gonna be off the brainstem. So brainstem right here, whoop. And it's gonna be exiting the superior orbital fissure or SOF. Some clinical scenarios of why the ocular motor nerve is important is because we're going to be dealing with light reflex. So similar to what we were just talking about, the sympathetic and parasympathetic about the eyes dilating, being super big and constricting like those little tiny dots, is that when you have light shine in your eye, your eye should constrict. Have you ever seen a cat? <laughs> I, God, I hope you've seen a cat in your life. But um, maybe I'm biased because I own... A beautiful baby girl named Peas and when she's super dummy and she wants to play her eyes are humongous they're just like oh, wait that's not well they're humongous she's just ready to play and she's trying to absorb as much as she can but when she's out chilling at the Sun like laying right by the window her eyes are super super tiny <laughs> like you know like the little cat eye slits that people are familiar with when they think of cats and that, that is, the, again, the pupil constriction because of that light that she's been kind of absorbing by just laying around by the window. <laughs> What's a cat? All right, I got you, I got you. There you go. <laughs> hi, Tara. Hi, welcome, welcome. 
um cats are cute i used to work at a farm and there was like, this cat who always had really big adorable eyes i i recreate the big adorable eyes anyway so yeah yeah yeah. so that's what happens basically uh, again your eye your eyes all normal life is good but as soon as light is shined into them your eye might do this Ta -da. <laughs> that's a scary cat it's okay let me delete all this i feel so bad anyone coming in it's like i thought this was a study stream and i'm like no i'm actually just shit posting right now <laughs> sorry <laughs> anyway uh, anyway anyway um so yeah uh ocular mode is also responsible for a near triad so it's dealing with um adjustments to viewing near objects i have an image that's gonna better explain this so just give me one moment um accommodation is also something that we'll talk about with the near triad so if you were to have a lesion for the ocular motor what's gonna happen is uh, how do you say it not only are we gonna have those droop droopy eyelids so yeah severe ptosis Pitos, pito, yeah pitosis let's see i can probably show you cubs a really good image actually that one's a little scary you know what, what if i just don't show you <laughs> yeah you know what actually wait no that one, this one's not as bad oh that's cute they fixed her eyes oh sorry i know it's like huh Okay, so, 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 this is severe uh, pitosis. This is again with that droopy eyelid thing that we were talking about. You see, normal eye, droopy eyelid, but they gave her surgery. So now her eyes are a little more symmetrical. Still, still a little higher, but yeah. Whoa, surgery. Ah, <laughs> uh, where were we? But yeah, they could have ipsilateral eye aimed outward and down. So what what is oh my god what was that again? Strombosis? Not thrombosis. Oh my goodness. Hold on. Uh How do you say this? Wait, pronunciation. 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 Strabismus. Strabismus, not stromboli, not strombola. And that's going to be when we said that the eye is aimed out and down. So I don't think this is a good image. Because that's not down and out. But um it's out. <laughs> it's out. <laughs> that's what's gonna happen when we have a cr uh, cranial nerve three lesion. We could have the diplopia, which is gonna be double vision. We can have defects in moving the same side of the eye, depending on where that lesion is. If the lesion is on the left side, then that means that the left eye is going to have trouble going down, in, and up. You may lose your pupillary uh, light reflex, which is going to be, again, that shiny in the eye. Your eye may not constrict. And you may lose the um, constrictor and pupil when you're trying to look at an, a near object. You might not be able to see that one. Tromboli sounds like a kind of pasta. I thought it was like, what do you call it? Um, oh, the Italian dessert. Oh wait, that's a cannoli. <laughs> Never mind. Never mind. <laughs> I'm uncultured. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, anyway, uh, why do paramedics shine a light on people's eyes when they're unconscious? Is it for their pupils to constrict? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, that's all I know from it. But yeah, that's normally why you'd shine the light to see if they're, um... Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> anyway. Um... I had Stromboli Strombolus for lunch. Wait, Strombolus sounds like a disease now. Hold on. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, anyway. Um... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So as you see, ocular motor is like... The big big boss when it comes to extrinsic eye movement and eye muscles a lot of things can happen when things go wrong so just don't let it go wrong forehead <laughs> e easy <laughs> so yes we talked about cranial nerve three let's talk about cranial nerve four the trochlear nerve the trochlear nerve is also going to be responsible for the movement of your eye but more specifically innervating this muscle called the superior oblique the superior oblique is going to be responsible for turning your eye down and in so you know when people are trying to be super quirky and they're like look at what my eyes can do and they start looking cross-eyed at you this is 
because they have really good control of their eye muscle but uh it's because also that their trochlea are nervous and work uh in function working functioning <laughs> i personally can't do that i cannot make myself cross-eyed but i can use my tongue to touch my nose and that's what matters haha <laughs> i don't know who it matters to but <laughs> it matters to me i guess <laughs> Anyway, so they're also gonna come from the big brain and they're gonna exit the same place of the superior orbital fissure and Pretty much if you were to have a lesion here in the trochlear nerve You wouldn't have good control of your superior oblique So again if the superior oblique is gonna turn your eyes down and in to make that like cross-eyed look your eye now is gonna go up And out I don't know why I wrote in huh Hold on because it would do the opposite huh that's so weird anyway that's why we go over our notes anyway and so because of this you're gonna start having diplopia which again it's gonna be that double vision so let's skip five right now and let's go to six because that's gonna be our last muscle when we're talking about these eye movements so the function is gonna be for innervating the lateral rectus which is another eye muscle that we have that's gonna abduct the eye abduct the eye what do you call it um Anyway, uh, for abducting the eye, it's going to be taking away the eye. So when you think of ABD, think of like abduct, abduction. Think of an alien taking you away. Wow, wow, wow. Maybe you don't think of that. <laughs> and that's what the lateral rectus is going to do. It's going to take you away from the midline, midline, midline. Yeah. So I don't know. I said that three times. My brain's like, what? <laughs> gonna take you away from that midline to go to the side and that's what your um <laughs> empty sense is responsible for it's gonna be emerging from the um ponti medulla junction so kind of in between the pons and the medulla oblongata the foramen is gonna use to exit is the s o f superior oblique fissure and the clinical scenario is that if your eye can no longer go out and you have a lesion that means that your eye is gonna go inward and that's also going to lead to double vision Okay, all right, let's talk about the trigeminal nerve, shall we? What if your parents used to say, if you keep your eyes like that, they'll stay stuck? <laughs> I think because they didn't want you to be fun and quirky, Berkey. I, your eyes shouldn't get stuck, but again, I'm not well versed in that topic because I don't really have firsthand experience. <laughs> anyway, so let's talk about cranial nerve five, okay? These muscles are directly attached to the brain or are these nerves oh these are the cranial nerves that are going to innervate uh these particular muscles they're going to branch out so what how we're breaking down the cranial nerves other than name and function is to show where they exit off from the skull and where they emerge from in the brain so where they emerge they're going to be super long and then they're going to go out a hole on the skull and then they're, they're going to innervate these certain things like, um, this is spoilers already, but we could talk about the accessory nerve. The accessory nerve actually innervates two muscles. And that's going to be your sternocleidomastoid, which these are better to get photos of because I'm just saying names and people are like, huh? Because trust me, <laughs> even I'm just like, huh? Ah, <laughs> uh, do 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 do. So the, um, eh, what do you call it? Uh, but I don't remember where the accessory nerve comes out from. But the accessory nerve emerges from the mandula oblongata, exits a hole or a foramen, 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 uh, from your skull, and it's going to innervate this muscle called the sternal hyoid mastoid. Why is it called this? Kind of cute. It's attached to the sternum, so the sternal. It's attaching to the clavicle, so cladoid, and it's gonna attach to your mastoid process. This is the bone right behind your ear. You can actually feel it a little bit. So sternoid, stern, uh, sternal, <laughs> cladoid, mastoid, and it's gonna function in what do you call it? Rotating your head. You can actually feel it a little bit if you turn your head. Like if you. <laughs> You know when people go check their pulse and they put like their their like two fingers on your neck? Well, pretend to do that with me and then also rotate your head and you might feel a little bit of, of a contraction and you're most likely going to be feeling for the uh, sternal clitoid mastoid, uh, what do you call it? Um, muscle. 
The accessory nerve also innervates this other muscle called your trapezius. And your trapezius is a huge booty muscle. It does a lot of things, but I think it's most popular for, um, or people know it most from, um, being the muscle that helps you shrug your shoulders. So if you're like, huh? I don't know. That's, that's your accessory nerve at work, innervating your trapezius muscle to help you raise your shoulders. Ta-da! Don't make me look weird at work? No, 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 it's always good to check your pulse. <laughs> is that the muscle that gets stiff when your neck is sore? Well, there's a lot of, there's a lot of muscles in your neck for God knows whatever reason. I want to say yes, but it really can just vary from person to person. So I apologize. Yeah, let's get back into it. So yeah, I hope that uh, I hope that helped out a little bit, Wolfie, to give you a better understanding. Like the accessory nerve specifically, that directly does go into a muscle. I mean, the other ones also go to a muscle, but I think those two muscles are more like app app blah 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 app app blah blah. blah, blah. <laughs> uh, uh, app app. You can apply it to your daily life. I can't just be like, oh yeah, your superior oblique muscle in your eye. You're gonna be like, oh, okay. Applicable, yes. Thank you. When I read it, it's okay. When I think about it, it's not okay. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, the body is complicated. Heck, the body. So yeah, sorry. Uh, before we scroll back, trigeminal nerve, okay? So trigeminal, why it says tri is because there's three branches that we'll talk about in just a moment. So for a trigeminal nerve, we're going to have branch one, two, and three. One is going to be the aldamic, the second is going to be the maxillary, and the third one is going to be the mandible. So let me see if I can find a good picture trigeminal. Ah, my clay. Hi, 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 Welcome. Uh, we are just talking about nerves. Ooh. So here's a better kind of uh, where these nerves go. So the trigeminal again is coming off from where? <laughs> where is it coming off from? Okay, the pond specifically. And each one, each of these nerves are going to exit different places. So the first one is going to exit still the superior orbital fissure. The second one is going to exit the um, rotundum. No, wait, 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 wait. Yeah, the rotundum, and the last one is going to exit through the old valley, the foramino valley. Hello, hello. <laughs> uh, yeah. So what's going to happen is that this first branch is going to innervate like anything up here, like above the eye. The maxillary is going to innervate anything underneath the eye to above the mouth and then the mandible is going to be responsible for your mandible it's going to be responsible for anything below the mouth right here so trigeminal is one of those cranial nerves or one of our first cranial nerves that's going to have both sensory and motor function for the sensory well this is going to be super quirky it's actually going to be dealing with sensation of your tongue the anterior two-third of your tongue is going to be innervated by the trigeminal nerve more specifically the lingual nerve which branches off the third branch of the trigeminal nerve <laughs> okay how do we connect this let's do this so trigeminal third branch of the mandible a mandibular nerve and that's going to branch into the lingual nerve which is going to be innervating that sensation of the tongue let me see if i can get a good picture of the tongue i saw kind of like a really monka-esque video which i kind of want to show you cubs but that's just me being funny <laughs> um not taste this is actually sensation so you could feel something on your tongue think of uh oh god i'm so sorry <laughs> Um, this is this is gonna be strange. So you know when you're young, <laughs> or I guess now the 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 stigma. No, there's not stigma. Ah, ah. Basically, you know when people are like, "Ha, huh, show." Well, don't don't show me you're a good kisser. Ah, you uh, you know when people are like, "Oh, can you tie this uh, cherry stem into a knot with your tongue?" Well, you're using your trigeminal nerve to eh eh. Which again, the lingual nerve is branching off that. And you're using that as a sensation of feel that cherry uh, stem. 
on your tongue but then you're also using your cranial nerve 12 the hypoglossal which is the mo that's going to be the motor innervation of your tongue to like move your tongue all around combining these two cranial nerves is going to help you tie that cherry stem am i good no i like flustered <laughs> but yeah 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 so that's the sensation it's you're not tasting the cherry stem which we'll talk about what nerve helps you taste you're dealing with huh there's something on my tongue and this is the sensation of it <laughs> and anyway um oh yeah i'm sorry i meant to go look at a picture of a tongue tongue innervation so uh this is hmm <laughs> So I'm trying to find a good picture right now. Mm. I feel like I have to just watch this video when he comes. And here's the. I watched this video of my classmate, and we just got like completely like uncomfortable together. So I'm like, you know what? That's that's a fun bonding experience I could do with you, Cubs. That's fine. No worries. So, the tongue is a muscle. Tongue, is definitely a muscle, right? Nerves, which so we're gonna skip it. <laughs> anyway, and the so extreme posterior of this responsible for taste. So basically, the tongue is right here, and so the tongue you're gonna have taste, you're gonna have sensation, and you're gonna have motor innervation. <laughs> Listen, imagine watching this with your classmate because they're like, look, we just have to watch the video. And then we saw that and we're just like, ah. <laughs> but this video is so good. Hi, Mr. Arbleachu. Hi, hi, welcome. <laughs> Everyone know that's kind of hot. Tip pulls out a five page essay, explains how to try his <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Anyway, look, 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 listen. So the tongue. Three things, taste, sensation, motor, right? So this guy actually does a really good job at explaining really fun mnemonics. So part of me is like, can you, you want to listen to that? Because we can listen to it. Hold on. We'll just call this part of the tongue the back. But I don't feel like we went over everything quite yet. Ah, okay. Here. Hmm. So... This is how we're going to divide your tongue, correct? So the anterior two-thirds is actually innervated by two cranial nerves. The facial nerve, which we haven't quite talked about, and then we also just talked about the lingual nerve coming off the trigeminal. The lingual nerve coming off your trigeminal is going to be your sensation, and the way that you're going to taste on the anterior two-thirds of your tongue is going to be your facial nerve. For the posterior one third, it's going to be all one nerve. For sensation and taste, it's going to be your glossio pharyngeal nerve, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And your vagus nerve is going to be like the super, super, super right back, and that's going to be the pharynx. So, me being the booty hole that I am, I'm going to speed this up, and we're just going to kind of go through it really quick, okay? General sensation and motor function. So, starting at the back of the tongue, think of this region as the area oh, hi, of the Welcome back. epiglottis, and pharynx. And even though the pharynx is a little more posterior and inferior, it helps us remember that the X in pharynx reminds us of cranial nerve 10, the vagus nerve. He's so creative with tongue, this. Cranial nerve 10 is responsible for taste <laughs> to this area, also sensation and motor function. Yeah. Now moving towards the bulk of the tongue, let's talk about taste and sensation first. Moving mm -hmm, toward mm -hmm. the posterior one third of the tongue, think P for posterior. Now if you flip the letter P around, it looks like the number nine. He's so, so creative, I love is it. It's elevated by cranial nerve nine, the glossopharyngeal nerve. <laughs> Cranial nerve 9 is responsible for both general sensation ah! and taste in this area. In the anterior two-thirds of the tongue, think A for anterior. Flipping the letter A in another direction makes it look like the letter V. And taking the numbers 2 and 3 from two-thirds and moving them here mm -hmm. shows us that taste to the anterior two-thirds of the tongue is relayed by know. cranial nerve 7, the facial nerve. General sensation wait, wait, it gets better. is mediated by the third branch of cranial nerve 5, which is the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve. So that's sensation, but regarding mm -hmm. motor function to the tongue, Let's add the sensory and taste cranial nerves of the anterior portion of the tongue. So that would be 7 plus 5, which would equal 12. Remember, cranial nerve 12 is the hypoglossal nerve responsible for movement of the tongue. There you go. Yeah, I actually sped it up a little bit. <laughs> I'm sorry. But yeah, this guy actually does have a really relaxing voice when he's not on 1.5 speed. Tongue is innervated by cranial nerve 9, the glossopharyngeal nerve. Yeah, I actually do like his voice a lot. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, 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 so. Now that we went through this really quick video, I can break it down and literally repeat the same thing that he said. So the back of the tongue, again, dealing with the three things, motor, sensation, and taste, the vagus nerve is going to be responsible for that, and that's going to be cranial nerve 10. A way he said we can remember this is that we can think of the pharynx, and the pharynx has a letter X in it, and X is the same symbol for 10, so cranial nerve 10. <laughs> And for nine, because that's all going to be the posterior version or posterior one third if for sensation and taste, that's going to be our glossal pharyngeal. So P for posterior. And then he's like, well, if you flip the letter P, it looks like a nine. And cranial nerve nine is the glossal pharyngeal, which is the posterior one third. And then he said for the anterior one third, if you flip the A, you get a V. <laughs> wait, how did he get facial? Uh, wait, hold on. And taking the numbers two and three from two thirds and moving them here. No! <laughs> He's so good! He's so good! <laughs> so, if you put the Roman numerals two... <laughs> I can't do this. I can't do this. Either way, look, listen. Facial nerve. Facial nerve, you taste with your face. And then the sensation is going to be the trigeminal nerve. Let's, let's get back to it, but with like lo-fi this time. All right. The things you have to do to remember this stuff is legit insane. Yeah, I just don't know why the tongue has to be so overly complicated. <laughs> but yeah, we're still on cranial nerve five. Heck, here, let me let me just go for five more minutes and then I can take my like baby break. <laughs> There are so many ways to remember it and really being also someone who's relatively uh, imaginative as well I think his way of teaching was very fun, but I was more like uh, how do you call it? I was like, yo, I was more like shocked. I'm like, wow, that's so cool That is like the coolest way to memorize it and because I was so shocked again that kind of put that like emotion into me So it just basically helped me remember a little bit more. I'm very grateful but yeah, so the trigeminal nerve, so if that's all sensory, let's talk about motor. So branches one to two for the uh, trigeminal nerve, that's going to be all sensory. How are we gonna actually test the sensory of your face is really funny, so let's see. <laughs> I'm like, let's do this quick, but I'm like, let's not do this quick. So you have, you have a guy, right? And this person closes your eyes, right? So what you're gonna do as a, um, <laughs> as a bear cat is you're gonna grab two things right you're going to grab a fun little like that's not that doesn't look fun like a brush and then in your other hand you're gonna grab like a needle <laughs> so what happens is that you're gonna imagine dividing the person's face in half and to test trigeminal sensation you're gonna do both uh, what do you call it what, what is the difference? It's like a sharp touch and soft touch. So with the brush, let me get the transparent. You, you, you test out each trigeminal nerve branch. So you'll test above the eye and you'll be like, hey, can you feel it here on this side? And can you feel it here on this side? Oh wait, let me move myself over. And then they'll be like, yes, I can feel it. I'm like, can you feel it here? And can you feel it here? And they'll be like, I, I can feel it on this side, but I can't feel it on this side. And that's gonna be a determinant like, oh, hey, because this is under their eye, this is gonna be the second branch of the trigeminal nerve on their left side that is not working. And then you'll also test like branch, uh, the third branch, which again, is gonna be underneath the jaw and the mandibular. You'll do the same thing for like this, the sharp on both sides. And yeah, that's how you're gonna test sensory. So the motor aspect of the trigeminal is dealing with the muscles of mastication. Mastication is just a really fancy word for chewing. So it's your, um, forgive me, um, om nom nom. So when you go om nom nom, you're using your muscles of mastication. Om nom nom. Okay, I, I, I go now. Uh, anyway. So if the trigeminal nerve again, it's going to be coming from the palms. We talked about the holes, uh, the foramen of the skulls that they come out from. 
and for the clinical scenario we're going to be talking about trigeminal, uh, trigeminal neuralgia this is super super interesting to me so this kind of disorder is rare and it, what happens is that it's severe unilateral pain to the face and it could be restricted to one division but normally it affects the second and third branch of the trigeminal so your maxillary and mandible normally your ophthalmic the first branch right above your eyes are not affected i think this disease or disorder has been referred to as suicide disease because sometimes the pain is so bad that people end up well yes um there's actually no cure for trigeminal neuralgia there's medication that may lessen the symptoms but anything could pretty much trigger this it could be laughing it could be chewing it could be doing absolutely nothing and it could trigger it and again the pain has just gotten so bad hi rip hi hi welcome hi wolf hi hi welcome as well how is you i is good how about you <laughs> here let's see Neur tri trigeminal neural neuralgia but apparently there's been some uh, good symptoms of it let's see why why does it happen hold on yeah apparently okay so this is what happens yeah i know the stream is suddenly tragic i'm so sorry but basically what happens is that this is super severe pain and because there is pretty much where doctors are like uh there's really no hope for you basically um that can lead to kind of severe depression and that's what kind of le leads to this not only does the pain hurt and there's nothing that can be done of it you just put your patient to a super depressive state oh but look the facial nerve haha <laughs> we can talk about that as soon as we get back from break <laughs> um but let me just spoil it really quick Files palsy here i won't take my full five minute break because i just i do want to get through the cranial nerves but uh give me one moment and I will politely uh, be back in probably like a minute, honestly. <laughs> ah ha ha, the facial nerve. Ah ha ha. <laughs> anyway, quick BRB, okay? Da 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 da. No, no, no. Guys, this is why you can't do gambling. It's bad. <laughs> anyway, I have class soon, so I think this might be the last 25 minutes that I do. So let's kind of speed through it if that's possible, okay? Anyway, oh, I forgot there's the love command. <laughs> oh, this is this is spooky. Anyway, let's start it, shall we? So the facial nerve, like I said, uh it 
it's gonna be dealing with facial expression so how we smile how we pout how we get so angry how we act surprised all these m movements of my face when i do this and even when you do this as well it's gonna be innervated because of this facial nerve this facial nerve is also going to deal with the sublingual and submandibular uh, mandibular uh, salivary glands and that's gonna help out a lot again with our muscles of mastication when you the facial nerve innervating the salivary glands is going to help aid in chewing and digestion. Facial nerve is also going to help with the lacrimal ducts, which is going to be like our tears. So, da da. No crying though, okay? Oh! Cochin! Uh, thank you so very much for the follow. Welcome to the Cup Club. Welcome, welcome! Uh, apologies for chat. <laughs> it's an exclamation mark love. <laughs> Wow. Anyway, um, for sensory, it's going to be dealing with the anterior uh, two thirds of the tongue for taste through the chord of timpani. Recall that the chord of timpani is going to be like that middleman. The facial nerve is so far away, so then it goes to the chord of timpani and then it gives that sensation of taste. And that's why you're able to taste on the anterior two thirds of your tongue. So, da da. <gasps> is that Sarek? <laughs> Sarek, hi, 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 hi. Welcome! Stop the timer! Heck the class! <laughs> hi, Sarek! Hi, hi! Sarek, I wanted to go beat you in a Pokemon battle, but I forgot I don't have... What do you call it? <laughs> I forgot I don't have the Switch online! <laughs> I wanted to beat you with my Pokemon team! <laughs> I'm gonna politely, um... Try to pull some strings. <laughs> but I hope that's doing super well. Your Pokemon League. I see the Discords, but then I see the pings, but then I'm like, I'm too lazy to pay five dollars right now. <laughs> hi Jun. Hi hi. Welcome. No, 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 sorry. You don't have to cover it. It's okay. Don't worry. I was offered a long time ago to join someone's family plan, and I'm gonna become a family. <laughs> Am I going on break for Bearcat school? No, 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 no. My semester is ending next week. Uh, next week is... So this week is my last... Oh, wait, where, where am I in space? Where, where am I? What? <laughs> uh, uh... <laughs> Uh, this is my last week of lectures. Next week is gonna be all finals, so this is why I'm doing this quick study stream. But Rip, thank you so very much for gifting us up to Sarek. I appreciate you very much. Welcome, Sarek, to the Sugar Bear community. Welcome, welcome, welcome. But yeah, ah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, better. I'm I, no, no problem, no problem. I won't, I won't. Anyway, but I'm glad you're here. I'm gonna. I have class at two p.m. and right now it's one eleven in Bearcat Mountain time. So I'm gonna speed run the study stream. I <laughs> uh, no, no, you're not a distraction. If anything, <laughs> but no, you're fine. You're fine. All right, let me, let me, let me, let me politely start back up the timer and politely <laughs> not try to drain in the shenanigans. So yeah, that's the motor and that's the sensory part of the facial nerve. So it's going to emerge from, again, the pons or the pontine mandula junction. The foramen it's going to exit off the skull. It's going to be the IAM, internal auditory meatus. The clinical scenarios for the facial nerve is going to be Bell's palsy. Bell's palsy might be a condition that you may have heard of. That's pretty much again a cranial nerve seven lesion where your face <coughs> okay now that i'm done dying um so your facial nerve is, um muscles are going to be paralyzed on one side your lacrimal submandibular and sublingual may be affected and your taste may also be affected but again only on the anterior two-thirds of your tongue Studying's hard. Bless you. Thank you. <laughs> well, I don't know what happened. I didn't even swallow or anything. My brain was just like, you breathed wrong. And I'm like, what? <laughs> but yeah, let me breathe and hydrate one moment. That tea that I made, um, like two breaks ago is finally cool enough to drink so i'm very happy <laughs> pasta check i got you too <laughs> yeah breathing <coughs> breathe is hard what the heck uh 
Ah, uh, thank you. Thank you for the head pads. I, I'm just gonna stop inhaling. I think maybe I have some liquid still in the back of my mouth. <laughs> I'm dying. That's okay. Call her doc. I am a doc. But thank you for the head pads. I do appreciate you very much. Please no. Cease breathing? Ashley, what is it? Please no or see, cease breathing. <laughs> Reading is super overrated. I'm about to only start being like a nose breather. No more mouth breathing. No more combo breathing. <laughs> oh heck, my timer's still going. No. Alright, let's start this over again, okay? Huh. But yeah, no wolf, I see ya. 1.2k, I will stream as long as I can. Maybe. <laughs> I'll probably do another study stream, not gonna lie, so no worries. Headpads are needed every so often. <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate you. I love the uh, positive reinforcement. <laughs> anyway, so yes, so we say Bell's palsy is going to affect muscle, uh, facial muscle expression. So how is that gonna look on someone? Whoop, it's not gonna look like that. Wait, where's my tab? <laughs> Wait, one moment. Where am I? <laughs> So how it's going to present is something like, uh, hold on, something like this. So you see, the person is smiling on one side, correct? But their facial muscles on this side is not going along with the smile. That again is Bell's palsy. Because there is a facial nerve lesion on one side of her brain, this side is going to be the one affected, and that is why it's not smiling like this side right here. Again, the sublingual and submaxillary salivary glands are also going to be affected, as well as the anterior two-thirds of the tongue, so some taste may also be affected. Vestibular cochlear is kind of a lecture that we'll go over maybe in the next study stream, but your vestibular cochlear is going to be the innervation for your balance and hearing. Vestibulo or vestibular, like the vestibular system in our body, is going to be dealing with a balance and the cochlear, which is going to be that shell-like structure in our ear, is going to be dealing with hearing. They're going to emerge from the ponti medullar junction and the foramen that they're going to use to exit is going to be the inter- sorry internal auditory meatus the i i a m similar to the facial both cranial nerve 7 and 8 exit from the same foramen if you were going to have an issue you would have hearing and balance dysfunction which again we'll talk about more at a later time okay for glossopharyngeal we're going to move on to cranial nerve 9 this is the cranial nerve that kind of gets me messed up a little bit so it can do both it can do both motor and sensory for the motor we're not going to really care about as much it's going to innervate the stylopharyngeus uh, muscle which is going to be something that helps elevate the pharynx and the larynx but really not as relevant as we want to for this specific uh, bearcat school class uh for sensory we're going to be dealing with uh the parotid gland the posterior one third taste and sensation of the tongue and the carotid sinus and body for the parotid gland, it's going to also be another salivary gland that's going to help aid in chewing and digestion for the food, making those muscles of mastication much easier to help you again get those nutrients in your body. We already talked about the taste and sensation more than enough for the tongue. And for the carotid sinus and body, that's actually going to be a chemoreceptor that we have in our body that's going to be dealing with blood pressure and heart rate regulation. The glossopharyngeal is going to be emerging from the medulla oblongata, as for the foramen, I'm actually not 100% sure that's something that I will politely highlight or look back into. And some clinical scenarios um, might be what I'm experiencing right now. So the glossopharyngeal nerve is going to, what do you so, say it? How do you say it? Um, if you were to have a lesion for your cranial nerve 9, you may have some issues with your swallowing or gag reflex. And if you're having issues with that, you're more likely going to end up choking. So as you see, I'm dying. <clears throat> and so I'm speaking in a much lower voice to not end up choking or dying. <laughs> so yeah, let's kind of move on. So vagus nerve. My professor absolutely loves the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve again is also going to be one of those cranial nerves that do both sensory and motor. For motor, it's also going to help with that gag reflex or the swallow reflexes and also give that somatic or body motor movement to the pharyngeal muscles as constrictors. 
which we'll talk about again later. For sensory, it's going to be dealing with the regula uh, regulating internal organ functions such as digestion, <clears throat> heart rate, respiratory rate, and certain reflexes such as coughing, sneezing, swallowing, and vomiting. Also, for sensory, it actually innervates a little portion of our ear. So if you were to brush, I think, the mid to top side of your ear and you understand <laughs> and you process that through your brain and you're like, ah, yes, I'm feeling my ear. It's also your vagus nerve at play. Uh, again, my professor loves this nerve because vagus is king apparently to him. And it's true because of the innervation that it does so much innervation. I silently take my leave again? Oh no! Uh, bye SG, thank you for stopping by, I appreciate you very much! Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you! But yeah, so your vagus nerve is going to be exiting the mandula oblongata and pretty much if you were to have a lesion in your vagus nerve, a lot of things will be affected but one of the main things we should focus on is about the laryngeal and the uh, muscles that we have there. So the <laughs> laryngeal nerves of cranial nerve 10. So if you were to have a lesion, the pathway of uh, the pathways of airways to the outside world would be affected. So you would have severe impact to reflexes such as coughing, sneezing, and speaking. We already talked about the accessory nerve with the sternocleidoid mastoid muscle and trapezius innervation. If you were to lose these, you would have things such as, what do you call it, wing scapula, which is kind of a little bit spooky to look at, but I mean, hey, this is a steady stream, so we can look at it if you want. Let me get this really quick. If you were to have sternocleidoid mastoid, you wouldn't really be able to kind of flex your head or rotate it. As for, um, <clears throat> wing scapula, um... Let me, let me get an example that isn't so spooky. It's actually really hard because they're all kind of spooky looking, so I, I do want to apologize. I'll, I'll grab this one. One moment, one moment. Oh, hi, Wisp. Hi, hi. Welcome. Severe impact? Yeah. Your, 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 uh, what do you call it? Vegas nerve is super, super important. So this is a very mild case, but you see how the scapula or like the shoulder blades in the back are protruding like this? This isn't necessarily normal. So this whole, the scapula isn't necessarily attached to anything. It's not like bone on bone. It's a lot of ligaments that are and muscles are kind of keeping it in place but if you were to lose innervation of cranial nerve 11 or your accessory nerve you would have a, a wing scapula again this is something you can google on your own time to look at the images because some are a little more spooky and severe and i don't want to spook anyone out and then the last cranial nerve that we have is going to be uh, the hypoglossal. We also talked about this a little bit more when we were talking about the tongue. And this is going to be referring to the uh, tongue movements. This is also going to be coming off from the mandula oblongata, so this little section right here. We can find it right here, this little bit yellow. Um, so yeah, uh, maybe a little bit better understanding for the tongue because again, they have like super high emphasis even though the tongue is really not that important to my major. So let's say if you bit your tongue, you would feel it with your trigeminal nerve. But if you were eating ice cream, you'd be tasting- Excuse me. You'd be tasting it with your facial nerve. So da da! Why does the face have so many nerves? Hmm, not just the face, but they're- 12 cranial nerves are just doing its job. Don't worry, don't worry. Uh, we have about 16 minutes, so these are things that are not as fun to talk about. Um, we could talk about... Let's see. Oh, we could talk about the eyes. We talked more than enough about the, um, <laughs> the tongue, so let's do this, okay? So let's talk about our vision. So what cranial nerves are involved? So we talked about cranial nerve 2, optic being, again, our cranial nerve that innervates vision. We also have eye movement, and the cranial nerves responsible for that are going to be 3, 4, and 6, ocular motor, trochlear, and abducens. So, there's actually this really cool round muscle surrounding your eye called the obicularis oculi. That- <laughs> I, I want to grab a picture, hold on. I can't just say it. it's cool and not show you cubs. 
It's actually this one's gonna be oh, this one is this spooky? Okay, this one's not as spooky. <laughs> So, oh, you see this round muscle right here? This is really what your muscle does look like. This is your orbicularis oculi. This muscle is going to be responsible for closing your eyelids. And what's going to innervate the closing of your eyelids is actually your facial nerve, so cranial nerve 7. What responsible is opening your eyes, or opening or uh, innervating the levator uh, pulpy... <laughs> pulp be brave superioris it's gonna be cranial nerve three your ocular motor nerve so yeah we talked about the dilation and constriction of your eyes and the muscles responsible for that is gonna be the dilator pupillae which is gonna dilate your pupils and the sphincter pupillae is gonna constrict your pupils again when you dilate your pupils and you innervate this dilator pupillae it's gonna be a sympathetic response remember sympathetic is dealing with that fight or flight so you want to grab as much information as you can so you're like whoa my eyes <laughs> and then when you're resting and relaxing you know rest and digest and parasympathetic your sphincter pupillae is gonna be uh, more at work and that's going to constrict your pupil so let's talk about some clinical scenarios that you cups may be familiar with okay so conjunctivitis aka pink eye so there's this little part of the brain brain your face and your eye called the uh conjunctiva and that's going to be a membrane that's attached to the inner surface of your eyelid this is actually really meant to protect your eye and this is going to prevent objects from entering your orbit or your eye and passing through the back of your cranial cavity so how do you say it this is when people get scared about like when they put contact lenses and they're just like oh no but this contact lens is going to enter my freaking freaking skull well no it's not because this membrane is going to help prevent that from doing that what happens is that if this membrane does get infected or inflamed, you get this um, this disorder called conjunctivitis, or more commonly again known as pink eye, which is going to be again inflammation or infection of the outer membrane of the eyelid, plus the inner eyelid. Uh, this pink eye can actually be due to allergies or again viral infections, and it's super 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 contagious, and it spreads easily with eye secretion. So that's why when normally someone has pink eye, they're just like, stay home stay home <laughs> so yeah <clears throat> uh one moment let me drink some tea huh? so if we don't have this we can't close it well everyone would have that muscle if that helps blood that I don't think there's really been any like issues of people not having that muscle. I think it's more the innervation of the facial nerve that they may not be able to close their eyelid. So that's super spooky. So we will definitely have an obic the orbicularis oculi muscle. Again, I I've never heard of anyone not having it, but again, just the issue of closing. Laura says, I used to be terrified of that as a kid. Things going under my eyes into my head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no need to worry. You have a protective mechanism and that's going to be your conjunctive eye. So no worry. No worry. Hmm. We talked about droopy eyelid already earlier in the study stream, which again, is going to be that lesion of cranial nerve 3 that's going to innervate the superior tarsal muscle. And that superior tarsal muscle, again, is going to be that muscle over our eyelid to keep the eyelid taut. Um, I don't really have necessarily a good picture of this, but we have different kind of humors in our eyes. We have the virtuous and we had the aqua, the aqueous humor. The virtuous humor is actually pretty much this. It's going to be this jelly-like posterior segment of the eye to help keep the eye shape. This is why your eyes are so nice, round, and squishy. It's because of this virt virtuous humor. For the aqueous humor, it's going to be more liquid. It's going to be similar to CSF or the cerebral spinal fluids that we were talking about earlier, like earlier in the semester kind of study stream, so like months ago. And that's going to be the anterior or the front segment of the eye. So what's going to happen is that the aqueous humor is responsible for bringing and providing nutrients to the eye. So what about glycoma? Have you cubs ever heard of glycoma? This is kind of like that blindness and spooky vision that people get in their eyes, especially I feel like in much older adults. 
Um, what happens is that individuals obtain glaucoma because the aqueous tumor constantly ma um, is manufactured manufactured and is drained back to the venous circulation but if it's unable to drain back you're gonna have that built up of that liquid and that's gonna cause vision problems which is gonna lead to blindness which is gonna lead to glycoma which again is just defined as that built up the aqueous humor which is gonna affect the nerve connections of the eye and brain which is gonna lead to that damage which again it's going to simply just lead to blindness Hi, 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 welcome, welcome, welcome. Hello. Unless you have astigmatism. Ahaha. Uh -huh. I'm so sorry. Oh? Oh no! Ah! <laughs> ah! Uh, hey, hey. Uh, Jason, thank you so very much for the tier one sub for two months. I appreciate you very much. Thank you for your continued support as a sugar bear. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And, uh, hello. <laughs> The fact half the medical conditions you're naming I know the name of because they're items from the binding of Isaac concerns me over the game's creator. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Why, why be concerned? That's smart. <laughs> but yeah, um, we can talk uh, briefly about the layers of the eyeball really quick in our nine minutes. So the eyeball is, divide is a three-layered structure. It can be divided into the fibrous, the vascular, and the retina. So let's kind of work our way in, shall we? So the fibrous is... I heard someone's graduating, not me! <laughs> not me! <laughs> but congratulations to them! Hi Wolf, hi hi, welcome, welcome, welcome! Um, so yeah, the fibrous layer, by the way, is gonna be the sclera and uh, cornea. The uh, sclera is actually just the white part of our eyes, so look! You didn't even see it in me! The uh, white part! White part of the eye! Yay! <laughs> <laughs> that's gonna offer protection the cornea is gonna be that transparent clear window in front of the iris so you can see it right here this is gonna be super <clears throat> uh, richly innervated with lots of nerve endings and it's a vascular which means that it actually doesn't receive any blood supply but again it receives a lot of nerve supplies even though it's a vascular it's still gonna receive nutrients of some kind and that's actually actually going to be from the air most of the nutrients that it receives is the o2 obtained through the atmosphere and that air is going to diffuse through the lacrimal fluids which is going to diffuse into the cornea again lacrimal dealing with the lacrimal ducts which is going to be dealing with where we cry from like the lacrimal tears so this uh, fibrous layer is going to be again our protective mechanism like even the tiniest of dust particles uh, can initiate the blinking reflex to kind of wash out and like uh, tear it out super 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 sensitive to touch so it's kind of scary so i forgot what cranial nerve is it but there's actually a special test to kind of test this out to see if their innervation is working correctly uh so they put a cotton ball into someone's eye, and if they don't blink, obviously there's something wrong with them. <laughs> um, their blinking reflex is not working. But yeah. <laughs> uh, just school break? Yeah, just two to three weeks. I don't graduate Bearcat school for another, like, three years. Uh, until spring of 2024, so a lot to study stream, so don't mind me, okay? <laughs> <laughs> the stream is too big brain for me no 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 this is why you break it down if you have any questions just let me know okay i'll try to answer them but I, again i'm only a student <laughs> wow air gives us uh, gives it nutrients that's amazing yeah 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 i think it's actually super cool <laughs> imagine blinking couldn't be me please blink <laughs> please, please clap <laughs> anyway let's go deeper okay let's talk about the vascular tunic so the vascular tunic is going to be our middle layer which is going to contain the iris which we could see right here the ciliary body and the chloride so let's talk about the chloride really quick because that's our outermost layer of this layer and this is going to be responsible for absorbing light and supplying nutrients and carrying away waste so it's kind of our cleaner uh helper picker upper cleaner guy <laughs> The ciliary bodies are dealing with lens accommodation, so this is going to be dealing with that nearsighted, farsightedness, uh, which we can talk a little bit about more later in the conditions that a lot of people have. I realize that a lot of you cubs have glasses. I mean, uh, I, 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 um, obviously have glasses too. Ahaha. Uh, -ha. 
But um, I realize it deals with a uh, kind of, uh, how do you call it, compensating for that nearsightedness and farsightedness. <laughs> oh, blue shirt kid. Hi, hi. Welcome, welcome. Hi, hi. I am. Um, we're just doing a little bit of studying. I only have five minutes left, so you'll have to forgive me, okay? Um, I normally do uh, study streams right before class, and I have class in like 30 minutes, so... Uh, <laughs> um... But, uh, thank you so very much for the follow. Welcome to the cup club. Welcome, welcome. And yeah, Mara, me too. I don't need glasses, but I think they're super cute. <laughs> um, for the iris, that's gonna be our, the color part. So that's gonna be like, hey, you have blue eyes. Oh, you have brown eyes. Oh, you have green eyes. Oh, you have, a uh, purple eyes. <laughs> And then our deepest layer, oh no, five minutes, it's going to be our retina. So all this right here, and it's going to be divided into two layers. We have the pigmented one, which is going to let us absor absorb light and prevent light from scattering. And we also have a neural layer, which is going to contain our photoreceptor cells, which is going to help us produce that action potential to our brain, which is going to help us process images. So like how you're seeing me or how you're seeing this eyeball image right now, it's because of that neural layer of your retina processing of, oh, I see these colors. Oh, I recognize this image. Oh, that's an eyeball. Uh, what do you call it? So our photoreceptors that we have are going to be our rods and our cones. We briefly talked about it before, but we can go about it over or we could go over it again if that's okay. So for our rods, again, we have so many rods in our eyes. They're super sensitive to light, but they're most active at low light. So again, if you're out at night and you see an object, but you're not sure what it is. Is that an animal? Is that a baby? Is that a bear cat? Is that what? What, what is that? You know, we're able to identify it, but we're not able to necessarily see it because we're not able to distinguish the wavelengths necessary to identify it in color. What you're going to be seeing is gray and fuzzy vision or like shades of gray. Our cones, on the other hand, are less numerous. Uh, but they need high levels of light to activate. They're dealing, they have very sharp vision and they deal with colors. The cones are gonna have the red cone, green cone, and blue cone. So we were talking about color blindness earlier and what happens is that an individual is born without a color cone. They're either born without the red, green, or blue and that's why they may experience color blindness which is why they see some colors but they're not able to see other ones. Did you know Cubs? You actually have a blind spot in your eye. We all do, but the issue is just because our eyes are always moving around, we don't actually recognize it. So at the optic disc specifically, this place has no photoreceptors, so we have no rods, we have no cones, and any light that passes through here will not process through the brain. And again, we all have it, but we just don't know it because we're always moving our eyes around. <laughs> Blind spot where? At the optic disc. Let me get an image really quick for you, okay? One moment. Mm. Ah, but thank you about the glasses comment. I, I do appreciate it. I, I also, I, I, I would like to agree if that doesn't make my, um, <laughs> my ego go up. But yeah, so here's the eye structure that we've been looking at, right? At the optic, this right here, this is tiny, tiny, tiny spot. It's going to be our blind spot of the eye. Light can process through here. So like, here's my cursor, here's the light. And light can go through here, but it's not going to be able to process in the brain. I heard that your nose is always in your vision, but the brain just blocks it out. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's why, like, right now, if you heard that comment, now you're kind of acknowledging that your nose is, um, <laughs> a thing. <laughs> but yeah. So we could talk about the, um, eye accommodation. So let me pull up the timer again. And we're going to be dealing with nearsighted objects and farsighted objects. So when there's an object really close to your eye, what's going to happen is that your lens right here is going to become more rounded out to adjust for that really near object. The ciliary muscles are going to be relaxed, the fibers taut, and the lens is at minimum strength for uh, the distant vision. Oh wait, I'm so sorry. That is for uh, far objects of where it becomes really rounded. Wait, what? No, wait. <laughs> Wait. What? <laughs> no, never mind. Don't don't look at this. <laughs> I have to look at that because I have conflicting information there, and I thought I knew one thing, but no, never mind. Um, yeah. So focusing disorder. Uh, we have 
hyperopia which is like the farsightedness so that just means that people who have far are farsighted are unable to see vision are, are <laughs> are able to see far but they're not able to see nearby objects the nearby objects are going to appear blurry and uh, myopia is going to be nearsightedness they're able to see objects that are really close to them but far away objects are blurry and this is why people would use glasses to kind of correct uh or compensate for this uh focusing disorder and again that all deals with the lens which i need to go back to and look a little bit more at because that's not right if I were to do a study stream again, we'll be talking about the ear, we'll be talking about the autonomic nervous system, and we'll be talking about a lot more other things, but right now it looks like my time is up. <laughs> the stream do be eye-opening? Yeah, just, 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 just a little bit. <laughs> ba <-ba> <laughs> but yeah. That that is that is pretty much it that I have for you Cubs. I have to get ready for a class, but not only just class, I actually have to get ready for a presentation that I have to do. So let's let's uh if anyone coming in, they'll be intimidated by this this picture. Dun 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 And let's do this. The hacking puns? Good stream, a lot was learned. Oh, that's such a relief. I'm so happy. <laughs> uh what do you call it? I always get nervous with study streams, but then they always turn out well, so I'm that's that's super uh what do you call it that's that's just really nice <laughs> oh my goodness there's a there's a good chunk of people streaming how huh? long <gasps> wait swippy streaming <gasps> swippy streaming i don't think i've gotten to uh rate her yet oh but boy's online too <gasps> but gator gator graves is online no <laughs> Okay, Cubs, I do the world's quickest, like, no, 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 not raid, not raid, not raid, not raid. Hold on. Ha, help, help me out. Oh, but Swibby just recently debuted, and uh, she's so cute. Everyone's online. But I don't get to see the skater guy either. But he's playing Monster Hunter. Cubs like Monster Hunter. Ah! Okay, sorry. You, 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 you can help me decide. I won't, I won't be too mad. I won't be too mad. <laughs> so we either go with Gator or we go with Egg. <laughs> Man, no, thank you, Amiko, but I appreciate you. Thankfully, it's going to be a really, uh, hopefully, a, a short class for me. And maybe we can study a little bit more. Maybe not on stream. Maybe I'll just go to my little study room on the Discord. So speaking of which, um, who's playing Monster Hunter? Uh, the Gator's playing Monster Hunter right now. But I I don't I don't get to raid egg often or at all. But I also don't stream normally really early, so huh. But yeah, 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 yeah. Please, if you haven't already, please feel free to join the Discord. Again, now that Bearcat School is gonna be over, we can actually do things again. <laughs> uh, well, it's not like we couldn't do things before, but now we can do things together, and that's actually pretty nice. So uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like Anime Night's gonna be coming back, and you know what? Heck it. We, we bring back Among Us. <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, but yeah. Have I thought about posting VODs on YouTube? I You know, honestly, I should. <laughs> I should. There's some VODs that I have downloaded right now. That now that now Funny enough. Uh, funny enough, actually. <laughs> uh, please follow me on YouTube. Uh, today, I'm going to be re-uploading the self-introduction video. I think I have it scheduled for like 2.15. So uh, please look forward to it. But the VODs that I have downloaded right now are like the Zelda. The final Zelda one. I downloaded the um, my last stream. The Hollow Life Friday Night Funkin' Avad because I thought that was super fun. <laughs> I don't know. I I maybe I should upload vods. I don't know. <laughs> I also feel strange because people also have like dedicated like separate vod channels and clip channels, but I don't think that's necessarily beneficial for me. Ah 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 ah. <laughs> I'll think about it 100% but I, I am and I will um now that Bearcat school again is ending I can focus a little bit more on streaming and kind of doing some housework around but yeah again please feel free to follow the discord I also have a youtube where I'm going to be uploading a video like within the next hour and I also have a twitter yes twitter is where I normally put my schedule up so I don't think I'm going to be streaming anytime in between now and the 22nd 
but uh, if I do again, it might just be a study stream. The 22nd against my birthday, and I hope maybe we could do like a little VR chat stream. So uh, please do look forward to it, okay? Ta da! <laughs> uh, I want to show you have some of my favorite VR chat places, and I, I don't know, it, it, it could be like a date, right? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's kind of cute, right? <laughs> oh no! Uh, Jason, thank you so very much for the 2000 bits. Thank you for stream. Best of luck in your class. I will do my absolute very best. Da da! <laughs> but thank you for the bits. I appreciate you to itty bitty bits. <laughs> But yeah, 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 yeah. When you're a small channel, it would be more beneficial to grow on your main channel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I just wish there was a more direct way for me to like end my VOD or end my stream right now and it just automatically uploads to YouTube. But I guess I'm just being lazy, huh? <laughs> but no, thank you, Fatino, for being here and thank you, Rika, for being here. I Again, I'm glad that the um, steady streams are going well and I could be... Um, uh, uh, useful ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> but thank you for letting me teach you cubs again i will see you hopefully before the 22nd but if not i will see you the 22nd and and or i'll see you on discord um the polls ended so we're gonna be raiding swippy she's a really cute egg vtuber who actually supported people like a cor cor uh, please please i don't know if i'm still his name right Hi, <laughs> of Courier C69, and she actually did his uh did his model, and she recently just re debuted with her new model, so she has a really cute new outfit, and she's so fluffy. <laughs> but yeah, please, if you want, please support us in the raid. If you are subscribed, or if you're not subscribed, feel free to use that first raid message with the berry bone, the gal gal raid. And then if you are subscribed, feel free to use this one, the gal gal raid with the tip of gal. Wait. Wait, I know on Twitch video editor, you can upload VODs without downloading them? Lem! Lem! Message me on Discord! Message me on Discord about that! We have to go! We have to go! Gal Gal <laughs> Alright, I see you guys later! Bye bye bye! Lots of love and have a good rest of your day and weekend! All that jazz! Ah! <laughs>